Okay, so no further ado, so it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Professor Max Rakinski from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he's an associate professor and a William L. Everett Fellow in the, both the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and the Coordinated Science Laboratory. Um, so many of you probably already know that Max has a very broad uh, range of interests, start going from probability theory to deterministic and stochastic control, information theory, machine learning, uh, nonlinear control and its applications to uh, circuits and um, other kinds of very interesting electronical systems. So um, Max has won an SF Career Award, um, has published a volume on concentration of measure along with um, now, I put myself on the spot. Sasson. Thank you, Igal Sasson, uh, in the now publisher, in this now publishing. So, um, so you should check that out as well. So that's a really nice volume. Um, and has given a tutorial on that same material at ISIT. Uh, he's won the NSF Career Award. And um, it's a pleasure to have him with us here today. Thanks, Max. OK. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, so this is a tutorial on, um, it's called information concentration and learning. So, you know, I mean, I've heard uh, quite a few of you asking questions like, oh, you know, should I switch from information theory to machine learning? Because everybody seems to be doing machine learning now. Well, when I uh, switched from mathematical physics into information theory, and that was about 2004, it was a long time ago, um, I was interested in problems at the intersection of machine learning and information theory. And I think I was just one of the few people who were interested in that stuff. Everybody else was doing wireless. Now apparently machine learning is hot, so I started doing it before it became cool, and you know, now I'm an old man, and I'm just kind of like, okay. Let's see what you kids have. Um, so this is uh, based on um, primarily joint work with my former PhD student, Aulian Shu, who's now um, a researcher at Qualcomm. Um, but you know, with some collaborators like Sasha Rocklin, for example, who's a professor here at MIT, um, Yi Hong Wu, who was my colleague at Illinois and now he's at Yale, and uh, Matt Tsao, who was an undergrad uh, at Illinois and now he's a graduate student at uh, Stanford. Um, all right, so I'll start with kind of laying out the background, giving definitions of stating the key results. So this part is sort of Let's just assemble all the ingredients. And then in the second part after the break, I'll uh, show you two detailed work, worked out examples of how we can use information theoretic ideas to um, quantify certain aspects of performance of machine learning algorithms. So, you know, and, and also along the way, I, I, I hope I'll be able to convince you that uh, there's no need to quote unquote switch from information theory to machine learning. You can happily combine the two as long as, you know, you, you kind of ask the right questions and, and have the right tools. And I think information theorists definitely have the right tools. Um, okay, so, so first of all, what is the, uh, you know, what is learning? Let's just, let's just kind of um, formalize a few things. So, I mean, it's just fancy word for solving stochastic optimization problems. So what happens there is we have um, some random quantity, random object Z, and that represents sort of, you know, some phenomenon of interest which we, um, uh, want to predict or uh, make decisions about or say something about its structure. But the main point is that this phenomenon has a stochastic nature to it and it has some underlying distribution mu. And um, before seeing this phenomenon, before observing this relevant state of the world, we have to choose some what machine learners call hypothesis. And it's denoted by W. Um, it's funny because, you know, just uh, uh, maybe <laughs> as, um, as late as five years ago, I would have used F instead of W and it would have been a function, but now everybody's using neural nets for everything. So uh, W is now the parameters of that neural net. So, you know, standing for weights. So, you know, you have to pay dues to the, you know, fashion of the time, so it's W now. Like I said, <laughs> it would have been F <laughs> just a few short years ago. And uh, once you've chosen this, uh, this hypothesis, then you encounter the realization of this phenomenon and that uh, incurs you a loss L. And your goal is to choose this W in order to minimize this expected loss, right? So here, uh, you know, some terminology, W here is an element of some what we call hypothesis space. So this is your hypothesis about what to do or, 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 or select or choose or, uh, or predict about this phenomenon. 
Z is a random quantity, and here I'm following this tradition where you know random variables are uppercase for the most part, uh, and deterministic qu quantities are lowercase. Um, and the uh, probability law mu, so this is our notation for the probability law if something is unknown, right? And, and then we have this loss function, which we can assume to be non-negative, right? So um, the term is, and this comes from classical statistics, the idea is that there's some, pop you can think about a population of, you know, or, or an ensemble of worlds where this phenomenon Z is generated according to mu, and um, if you were to act according to this W on each of those and then average that, right, by the law of large numbers in a large collection of these multiple universes, um, if you could observe all those copies, you would observe this L mu W, this is a population loss. And, you know, the learning aspect comes about because we're, we, we don't know mu. If we knew mu in principle, let's suppose that we could find an optimizing W given enough computational resources. But we don't know mu, so that's the problem, right? This is the learning problem. The learning comes about uh, from the fact that instead of having access to enough knowledge about mu, we are given n IID copies of Z. Right, so I'm gonna use this uh, bold Z to denote this random vector, random tuple consisting of n IID copies of, uh, from mu. Okay, so, um, and this is, the, this is where the learning algorithm comes into play, right? So what we're given is this, we call it training data, um, right, and this, and our sample from this n uh, full tensor product of mu, right, just a fancy notation for saying I generate a sample of n instances um, independently from mu. And a learning algorithm is basically a stochastic transformation, or as information theorists would call it, a channel, from training data to a hypothesis, right? So we have some uh, Markov kernel, right, it would be the fancy term. It's not a conditional distribution yet until you specify the, you know, uh, until you specify the uh, marginal distribution of Z. Once you do it, it becomes a conditional distribution. That's just kind of terminological, you know, nitpicking. But, but the point is that what, what happens is we take the training data and then we possibly may use some random number generators in addition to uh, the training data and come up with a hypothesis W, right? So, so W now is a random element of this hypothesis space and, you know, it, it's drawn uh, um, as some sort of a randomized function of Z. And uh, you've seen Adam Smith's tutorial on differential privacy. I hope he had convinced you of um, the usefulness of randomization when, um, when you make decisions or, or, or process statistical information. We're going to see that that's actually useful in order to obtain um, good performance. So the goal of learning is to design this channel, this transformation, um, in such a way that now, suppose somebody hands you a fresh realization of Z that you haven't seen before, sampled independently from the same distribution. But now you've generated this capital W and then you use that as your action, right? So you take this action. Now notice that what you're doing is here, this uh, averaging with respect to Z represents this idea that uh, on average, on a fresh sample, this is going to be your performance. Notice that W is uppercase. So um, the way to think about this is if you go back to the previous slide, you see this L mu of W, here W is a det deterministic input. You can think about this as a functional of W, right? So now, just think about that as a random variable because it is a random variable, right? And what we want is, is for the learning algorithm to, um, to make sure that this quantity is as small as possible, right? So, you know, either an expectation or, which is typically better, with high probability. And here the high probability would refer to two things. It would refer to uh, the randomness that was used up by the algorithm, so these, you know, any, any coin flip that the algorithm uses, and also the training data. So the idea is that somehow you wanna make sure that um, the algorithm and the training data interact in such a nice way that the probability of making a bad choice of W given the data is as small as possible, right? Okay, so, just to kind of, you know, set, um, set the tone of this, let's, let's look at a couple of examples. Here's, here, here are two examples. Um, and, you know, if you are considering, in fact, 
kind of working on some machine learning problems, this is the terminology you'd eventually want to um, become comfortable with. So here's the first problem is binary classification. So, you know, I mean, how many of you have seen Silicon Valley, the show on HBO? Uh, there, there, was a, there was a funny part there where um, I think one of, the, um, one of the characters came up with some sort of a, a, you know, sophisticated artificial intelligence program to apparently, you know, classify images of food and all it could do is determine whether it's a hot dog or not hot dog. Um, so this is what you're doing here. So X here is a space of pixels, you know, like these are the Instagram photos of food. And, um, and uh, the zero one uh, value thing is a label. So, you know, zero is not hot dog, is one, is one is hot dog, but then, you know, because everybody's fancy, use a convol convolutional neural net to do it. Right, so W here would be the weights in a convolutional neural net, and then, you know, FW is a classifier. So it's, you know, when, when you take the, you know, the, the pixels um, from the Instagram image and you send them through a convolutional neural net, it does its thing, and then at the end, you know, and then you're going to probably threshold the output uh, to get a binary label. And the loss here is the good old zero one loss, right? So it's now Z here is a, um, is a, is, is a tuple, right? Consists of this feature and the label, and then you pay $1 if you guess the label incorrectly, and you pay nothing if, uh, uh, if your guess is right. And then, you know, your loss is just the probability of error of this classifier, right? Um, and then uh, if instead of binary decisions, now you want to make real value, let's say predictions, typically that's called a regression problem. Once again, you have some feature and Y is typically called a response. And then each W once again corresponds to a predictor. And you know, again, because these days everybody's first impulse is to, you know, throw everything into a neural net. FW would be a neural net. And, but now you don't threshold its output. You just take whatever you get. So, you know, the output layer is just one, one unit and that unit generates a real valued activation. You take it. And now your loss is the quadratic loss, right? So once again, you say, okay, so how far am I from the true response? And then you take the square of that. And so your um, expected or population loss is this MSE, mean squared error. And these are examples of what's called supervised learning problems. And supervision here comes from the fact that your instances Z naturally split into a pair X, Y, where X is something that at execution time or at test time, as, as, as it's called, you'll get to observe. And Y is something that's hidden. When, you know, once, once you've chosen this W, you never get to see the Y, you see X. And then you need to come up with your own guess for what Y is. There's a true Y that, that sits out there somewhere. And during training, supervision comes from the fact that somebody has helpfully provided you samples of X's and Y's. So, so supervised learning is a prediction problem. Um, by the way, if, if you have any question and you raise your hand, I will not see it because my eyesight is not great. So just shout, uh, interrupt me at any point. Um, and here's the other set of examples. So these are slightly different. Now suppose that, so here's, let's look at clustering, which is often a first part of any kind of um, sufficiently complicated data analysis pipeline. Um, so now Z is a metric space, let's say with some metric row. So this metric row measures distance between elements of Z. W, our space of hypotheses, is now going to be the K, Kth uh, Cartesian power of Z. So what we're going to do is we're going to generate K tuples of elements of Z as our hypotheses. And the loss, so now W is a, um, is a tuple like this, right? So it's W1 through WK are actually elements of Z. And then we say, okay, here's a new element of Z. So what's our loss? The loss is actually now I'm gonna look through this collection of, uh, of uh, K elements and I'm going to find the closest one to Z and I'm going to penalize um, this choice by some power of this metric row. And now my loss is this, right? So what you do is you find the nearest neighbor of Z in your W, which you know, if you are an information theorist and you've worked on source coding as I have, this is my first entry into information theory was lossy source coding. That's where I applied the ideas from learning theory to universal lossy source coding. Um, you know, this is your nearest neighbor encoder, and then you know your distortion is now a uh, pth power of some metric. And this is actually so statisticians or machine learners would call this clustering. We call this fixed rate vector quantization. It's the same thing. Um, right, except you can think about a sort of universal 
uh, quantizer or empirically designed quantizer because you don't know mu. Another problem is density estimation. So sup now suppose your Z is now a subset of uh, D-dimensional Euclidean space and each W corresponds to a probability density FW. So W is some parameter of that density. So, you know, in the old days it would be like mean and variance of some parametric model. Now again, you know, everything is done with neural networks. So how are densities generated? Um, you can think about starting with something boring like a M-dimensional standard Gaussian and then you send that through a neural net and so what happens is then you crack open your probability textbook and you find this formula for, you know, the density of a transformation of a random variable. There are Jacobians, except now um, what, what could happen in this neural net is a dimension of the output layer. The number of neurons could be much larger than the, than the dimension of the Gaussian you started with. So now all of a sudden you're modeling data that uh, are supported on manifolds. And this is actually the basis of things such as uh, generative adversarial nets, GANs. So, you know, so, but, but this, this is the ba basic idea and the loss that you incur, now this is your, your, your point Z and you say, okay, so this is the probability density value um, at my chosen W for Z and you pay negative log of that. And so the loss is just expected value of this, which, you know, you could relate to differential entropy if you wanted to. But these two examples are examples of unsupervised learning. There is no natural splitting of Z into a product of two spaces, all we're looking for is some structure in this probability space. So either, you know, does, um, is there some sort of like, so for clustering you can think about almost like a mixture model where you can identify different components in this uh, mu such that, you know, uh, points that have overwhelming mass under one of the components have very little overlap with points, you know, in other components. And density estimation you actually uh, you don't care about finding these clusters, you just want the whole, the whole surface, so to speak, right? So hopefully this, this gives you an idea of what, uh, and this is a pretty wide range, I didn't even cover all possible problems. I didn't even talk about things like reinforcement learning or anything like that. All right, so um, now let's, let's, so let, let's see how we would, uh, what would we do. Um, right, so the idea is that, okay, so now you've written your Python code and you have this neural net and it does its thing. Um, but the thing is that you, um, so of course, when you train this, if you know what you're doing, you're going to do some, some sort of a cross validation, right? You're going to take your training data and you're going to randomly withhold a subset of some size as, as a testing or validation set. You're gonna train on the remaining data, then you're going to test it on the validation set and you're going to repeat this multiple times. You're going to choose a random subset to withhold again, retrain, test again, see what's going on, right? So that's, um, but in general, once, okay, so now, now once the system has gone into production, let's say, and, and ends up on somebody's phone, you know, um, every once in a while they wanna see how you're doing. The thing is that, you know, when, when the system is used in the wild, there's no supervision anymore, right? So what do you do? How can you assess whether what you've learned is, is good? So you should be able to, um, evaluate or estimate the performance of this learned hypothesis based on the information you have. And you don't have that much, you ha just have the training data. Right, so, okay, so if, if we chose a fixed hypothesis ahead of time without looking at the data, this is just some deterministic quantity, right, and we can compute its empirical loss, right? So here the notation is L, this bold Z as a superscript denotes the fact that all we're really doing is we're taking this W and we're looking at the sample average of its loss on that um, training set. And of course, because W is a deterministic quantity that was selected without looking at the data, this is an unbiased estimate of the population loss, right? Simply just by linearity of expectation. Right, and you of course, you know, the first thing you would do if you were to obtain capital W's, you would try to, to do the same thing because it's, it's very easy to do. You already have your data, right? You've trained the thing and now you just uh, compute the sample average. And it's called, this is called the resubstitution estimate. But, but it's also, you can think about it as the empirical loss of the learned hypothesis, the uppercase W, on the data that gave rise to it. And you know, the nice thing about this is that it is easy to compute from available information. Let's suppose you don't have the luxury of testing or you're lazy or whatever. But it's a biased estimate. So, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to compute, but it's a biased estimate. And we want to get an idea of what this bias is. And this gives us 
the definition of generalization error, right? So generalization error is not going to be a functional of the input distribution, of the feature distribution or instance distribution, which we don't know. And the algorithm, which is this channel, right? Um, and it's simply the expected value of the difference of two random variables. Notice that both of these are random variables. This is what happens when you um, take your learn w and then you apply it to a random example chosen independently from, independently of the training data, but from the same distribution. And you compare that to the empirical loss on the data that you've trained on, right? So that's, um, and that's called the generalization error. Why is it called generalization? So this is the whole uh, sort of, you know, difference between classical statistics where you have some data, data come from some population, all you care about is just recovering some parameters of the distribution of that population. Whereas in machine learning, the, you know, the objective really is this predictive kind of uh, criterion, right? So you get a new sample and now you should be able to do um, um, something with good performance on that sample, which you haven't seen before. And generalization just means the ability to sort of generalize from past experience, the ability to, you know, extrapolate. Uh, why is there a reason why this is like absolute value? Um, yes. It um, after the expectation. Yes. But it, could be it could be negative, yes, or positive. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> it's um, you'll see the reason why. It, it, it's it's because with, without absolute value or a square, you can actually there's going to be an identity, a formula that's going to be you know. That's going to hold with equality that's going to express this uh, in terms of something else that we can immediately then go from that to uh, uh, various information theoretic criteria. If I had the, so there's a way to, to also control the, either the absolute deviation or, or the um, I expected square, but uh, um, dealing with those is a bit more complicated. So for a variety of reasons, and you'll, you'll also see why, you'll also see why it's useful to do it this way from, from another perspective? Well, that's a good question. All right, so um, this is, by the way, an answer to, partial answer to that question. So um, what does this generalization error actually tell us? So, you know, I mean, again, if you're an information theorist, you're used to seeing functionals of a pair of a distribution in the channel, like mutual information. So it's sort of like that, right? But it's somehow tied to a particular loss function. So Okay, so let's suppose that there exists an optimal hypothesis, right? Meaning that's the one that if you had known the distribution new, you would have picked that hypothesis. And then you would uh, go with that every time. There'd be no need to learn anything. So one of the things that uh, you worry about in machine learning is what's called the excess risk of, um, of your uh, learning algorithm. Meaning the following. So now I run my learning algorithm and it generates some W and I look at its expected population loss and I compare it to this uh, L mu of W opt. This quantity of course is always non-negative, right? Uh, because nothing can do better be because you know, L, L mu W is larger than L mu uh, of W opt point wise, right? For any realization of W, just by definition of W opt. So um, this is kind of, the, if you if you're taking a course on learning theory, this is the first thing you would do. You would basically insert, add and subtract the empirical loss. Um, and once you do that, you also notice that, well, this W opt is a deterministic quantity that doesn't depend on the data. Therefore, its population loss is actually, by unbiasedness in this case, expected value of the empirical loss on the same data that was used to train. Now you see that we've split this excess risk into two terms. So there's that generalization error right here. And then there's this um, gap in performance between the learned hypothesis and the optimal hypothesis that you would have chosen had you known the data. And now we'll see that, you know, here's one sufficient condition to make the excess risk small. The algorithm has to generalize, right, on average. And also the empirical loss of the learned hypothesis and the truth should be close on average, right? So for the most part, statistical learning theory um, is concerned with a class of algorithms called empirical risk minimization, right? 
and it is mo motivated by, by this decomposition. So what do we do? We take our training data, and for each hypothesis we compute the empirical loss, we simply pick the one that gives us the smallest value of this empirical loss. Right, it's, so here the idea is uh, the sample average access proxy of, um, of the distribution. I just pick W that gives me the smallest empirical loss. And then, of course, you know, now we have this decomposition of the excess loss. This is against the generalization error. And this uh, TERM is a conditional distribution that's basically going to be um, probably a deterministic thing. So, you know, you have some sort of a tie-breaking rule to pick. If there are multiple minimizers, you pick one with, you know, um, let's say you ordered them somehow, you pick the one with the smallest index. Um, or you just pick one at random. But the point is that um, you see that the second term, here we have a minimum of the empirical loss over all Ws. In particular, you see that this term is gonna be smaller than that, obviously, because you know, even though W opt is optimal on average when we know the distribution, on that particular sample, it may be pretty bad. So this quantity is gonna be non-positive. Non so we can forget about it. And therefore, we see, and therefore we see that for empirical risk minimization, the excess risk is actually bounded by the generalization error of our ERM algorithm. And then, you know, this is where, where this classical statistical learning theory um, you know, starts from, from the wor uh, you know, work of uh, uh, Vladimir Vapnik and uh, Alexei Chevranyankis and people like that. And then, you know, and, and then we'll also have um, statisticians um, in the US who worked on what's called empirical process theory, such as Richard Dudley and John Wellner and, um, and people like that. So um, what you can do is you can just crudely, you can forget about the algorithm, just upper bound this difference by the supremum over all hypotheses of the absolute value between the sample risk and the population risk. And so interestingly, um, if this quantity goes to zero as we increase the sample size, then we have consistency, meaning that eventually you're going to do uh, with high probability as well as, nearly as well as the optimal hypothesis. Right, and so the classical statistical learning theory is concerned with what's called uniform laws of large numbers. Here the idea is that if I forget the supremum and I fix a W, this quantity has, these are just the absolute fluctuations of the empirical risk around the mean, and we can study that using ideas from probability theory. Um, so for example, if the loss is bounded, this will be on the order of one over square root n with high probability. You can use something like the Chernoff bound to convince yourself of this. But the supremum kind of you know, messes things up a little bit so if W is, uh, if this hypothesis class is finite, finite, you can use a union bound. And uh, the union bound more or less gives you uh, a similar answer, except you're going to pay a price of maybe log of the cardinality of, of, uh, uh, of your hypothesis space. And uh, the more sophisticated apparatus of statistical learning theory then says, okay, well, typically what's gonna happen is this W is not gonna be finite. If we're talking about something like neural nets, then you know we're, we're looking at uh, um, a subset of a high dimensional space that contains the weights of all the neurons. Um, but you know, more classical things like support vector machines, these would be you know, the parameters of some you know, generalized linear classifier or something like that. But the point is that what you do is, it, what matters is not the weights themselves, but sort of this, what's called the induced function class. These are not functions, so if I fix a W, um, then uh, I end up with a real valued function of the data that's just the loss with that W. And this function class has to be quote unquote not too rich. There are ways of doing it that ultimately amount to doing something like union bound on multiple scales. And then, you know, adding the results appropriately. And in many cases you can end up with, an, with a bound that looks like this. So this expected supremum. Now notice that this is completely algorithm independent. Right, because now we're looking at the supreme over W, but you can upper bound it by some constant C divided by square root of the number of samples. And this constant C is some sort of measure of complexity of this induced function class. In other words, how good is, um, how discriminating this class of hypotheses is. If there's a way to somehow come up with a good um, uh, loss with a, with a very small loss on any training data set, that means that you, know, you have ability to overfit and so the C is gonna be large. But on the other hand, if at some point um, 
the, there's some what's called inductive bias in your choice of W, meaning that, oh, okay, so some hypotheses, um, yeah, so, so it doesn't matter how, how much data you have, eventually your ability to see patterns where there aren't any goes away, and then you, you'll be able to generalize. And so like I said, this is, this is sort of bread and butter of classical statistical learning theory. Um, but you see, the problem is that that bound is too loose in general, right? Because um, empirical risk minimization assumes that somehow you're going to eventually look through in a sense, you're going to look through all the possible hypotheses and pick the one that gives you the smallest risk. Um, and in order to guarantee that that is uh, going to work, you need to restrict the complexity of your hypothesis class. Which, uh, you know, with neural nets, we don't know exactly. Clearly, there's, there's some implicit capacity. Well, capacity not in the sense of Shannon. This is more uh, approximation theoretic capacity. There, there's clearly some sort of capacity uh, implicit uh, regularization that's going on, but we don't understand how it works. Um, moreover, you know, it, 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 this bound completely ignores the details of the interaction between the data and the algorithm. Now just because it completely erases what the algorithm is doing, right? It just takes a supreme over the hypothesis space. So that, you know, here the algorithm could be absolutely anything. And this bound is more or less just destined to work only with empirical risk minimization. But if you have some computational constraints, let's say you know, you're not going to minimize the risk. You're going to run this algorithm for a certain number of iterations, um, or you have some memory constraints or something like that, you're not even going to explore the entire hypothesis space. So it seems like it's too, asking too much for the supremum um, to behave well. And in fact, you know, so, so uh, when, when this quantity decays with n, we say that this is the uniform, uniform convergence, uniform convergence of empirical, empirical means, where uniform now uh, refers to the choice of w. And you, you can easily construct examples where uh, uniform convergence does not hold, meaning that this quantity actually does not go to zero as n goes to infinity, and yet learning still takes place. In other words, you know, you have an algorithm, and it does something, and its excess risk goes to zero as n goes to infinity, but this bound is, is too loose. So for example, there's a paper by um, Shalev Schwartz et al. from 2010 that um, revisits notions of stability and you know, gives some examples of this. OK, so, so then this attempt at bounding the generalization error is um, useful, but uh, kind of, you know, this is, you can think about a sort of the, uh, the, the, you know, the modernist approach. Now let's look at the postmodern approach, right? So, so what does this generalization error really tell us? And uh, now let's see, um, this idea of introducing two, two independent samples from the same distribution. So what I do is instead of generating n training samples, I generate two n. Right, so Z and Z prime are two independent training sets. So what's going to happen is what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at my current training set, which is just the Z. I'm going to take one of the indices and I'm going to replace that with its, you know, sibling from Z prime. Right, and I'm going to uh, denote by W the output of my learning algorithm in the original data set and by W the superscript I, the output on the new data set, uh, on this modified data set. So, so in terms of statistics, in terms of distributions, nothing has changed, right? The joint distribution of this and W and this modified training set in WI is exactly the same. But if I look at conditional distributions, something has changed because I've, you know, what I've done is I've replaced one of the training examples with a copy. And the interesting thing is that you see, when you write, so now I fix this index i and I write down all of these things. So here's my w has been generated based on z1 through zn and here's this interloper zi prime. Well, the joint distribution of these quantities is equal to the joint distribution of these quantities, right? So I just, re, it, it's simply, you know, when you do multidimensional integrals, you rename variables. This is just, you know, renaming zi and zi prime. And now, of course, I'd have to rename w into wi because, you know, I want to keep this consistent. The distributions are exactly the same. So once I write down the generalization error, you see this population loss of w 
It's the same as the empirical loss, but on a fresh independent data set, right? This, so this first term is simply saying, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate an independent example, zi prime. I'm going to look at the average loss of w. w was learned on the original unprimed z's. Right, so I just substitute that in, and I use this distributional equality in each term. And what happens here is that here I can easily, well, here I keep zi prime, but here I, I can switch zi prime and zi, but then I have to rename wi. So now you see this is pretty interesting because, well, what you would do then is you would go ahead and you would um, um, remove the primes, let's say. But what's remaining is a sum of terms, and each of them tells me expected difference in losses on a learning algorithm that's given an example zi, but one of the w's is learned on an independent data set, and the other one is learned when I take that data set and just uh, throw in the zi that I'm trying to test it on. So you see, in each of these terms, what I'm doing is I'm changing just one training instance in my n samples. So generalization now is an average measure of sensitivity of our algorithm to um, local modifications of, of the data. If I had the absolute value uh, here, it wouldn't have been so easy to, um, to come up with this equation. So this is an identity, right? So let's keep that. So the idea here is that somehow this refers to the stability of the algorithm with respect to the training sample. So once again, think back to Adam Smith's tutorial when he was talking about differential privacy. Um, so what he called a mechanism, we would call a randomized algorithm, let's say, or a channel. And he was talking about this idea that somehow um, in the space of distributions, this conditional law of W given the data is not particularly sensitive to replacement of one of the elements of the data set with something else. And this is basically algorithmic stability. So we want to argue that this, if this sensitivity is somehow controlled, then we're going to have good generalization. And this has rich history. So, so this idea uh, was introduced by uh, Rogers and Wagner and DeVroy and Wagner in late 70s. And as far as I can tell, the first, term, the first time the term algorithmic stability was used uh, was 20 years later by uh, Kearns and Ron. And then, you know, then there's, you know, stability kind of, in a sense, went mainstream with this uh, paper by uh, Buske and Eliseyev that kind of started the whole thing again. Uh, and then, you know, these papers by Poggio et al., uh, Rockland et al., and the Shalef Schwartz et al. This is actually an interesting paper because the last names of all the authors start with S, and I think there are like four of them. And one of them actually has two S's in their name. Um, that's a very nice paper. You know, if you want to kind of, you know, get into uh, this whole stability stuff and understand what it has to do with optimization, read that paper. And the thing is, that, okay, so, so these things started growing like mushrooms. For example, uh, Sandy Kooten and Parta Yogi in 2002 proposed at least 12 different notions of stability and like, oh, you'd use them in, you know, various contexts. We really got to do something about that. So um, let's see. So, so here's one example. It's called uniform stability. Right, so let's look at this generalization. As a reminder, this is what it looks like. Here's one notion introduced by Bousquet and Eliseyev. So it would say that this algorithm is epsilon uniformly stable if the following holds. For any i, for any index of a training set. Um, so what happens here is I have two data sets, z and z prime, they're independent. And then I take another, so think about testing time. So I take just a fresh instance and I look at the losses of um, W and WI on this new point and I look at the supremum of the, this conditional expectation. So you see this definition does not involve the data distribution. It's purely a property of the conditional distribution of the algorithm given the data, right? Um, and uh, uh, here, you know, the, uh, there's still an expectation because the algorithm may use some coin flips, right, in order to determine which W to use. So this is, we do average of the internal randomness of the algorithm. Well, let's see the consequence of this. Well, if the algorithm is uniformly stable, then I can look at the ith term in this sum, right? And, you know, this is the first thing you would do. You would uh, do the law of iterated expectations. You condition on z and z prime. And then you see that once you condition on z and z prime, the data become deterministic. I can now take the supremum 
over that. And then supremum goes outside the expectation by convexity. And we see that this term is less than or equal to epsilon. So if uniform stability holds, then generalization error is less than epsilon, right? So that's uh, a good property to have. And some algorithms are generally are, you know, just uh, uniformly stable. For example, if your loss is a strongly convex function of W, then empirical risk minimization is actually uniformly stable. And that's a result. I mean, you, you can actually see that in the paper of Shalev Schwartz et al. Okay. Um, but instead, um, Let's, uh, you know, let, you, uniform stability still refers to a particular loss function. Let's, let's think uh, more broadly. And, and once again, look at this definition of uniform stability. And we see it's really a statement about the conditional distribution, right? It's so a conditional distribution. So now I give you two data sets, Z and Z prime. Now they are now deterministic and they differ in one example. So we can think about that. Once again, think back to Adam Smith's tutorial when he talked about you know, this Lipschitzness of a mapping from some Hamming space into, uh, let's say, a space of functions. Here, what we have is Lipschitzness of a mapping from the set of n tuples of uh, points in Z to the space of distributions. And we, what we do is we put some sort of, we put the Hamming distance, right, which is just the number of indices in which z and z prime differ as a metric on our data space. And then we measure some distance between these conditional distributions and say, okay, well, this distance has to be small if the two data sets differ in one element. And, and this is now very reminiscent of differential privacy. Right? I mean, and, and then, you know, and you see, uh, I think there are as many notions of different differential privacy types um, as there are notions of stability. I mean, there's uh, the original differential privacy, there's concentrated differential privacy, I think there's rainy differential privacy, you name it. There's the, it's the local differential privacy, there's, there's a lot of it. But all of these really amount to saying, well, I have some, uh, some algorithm, some randomized mapping from uh, a product space into some other space, and I'm just looking at the Lipschitz continuity of that mapping uh, with respect to the Hamming distance which is a, a very coarse metric, right? I mean, it's like you're just counting the number of coordinates in which z and z prime differ. Right? But we'll come back to differential privacy later. All right, how am I doing on time, by the way? Yeah. 10, okay, perfect, 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 yeah. Good, okay, all right, so, um, so then, you know, again, once, you, once we start talking about distributions, this is, you know, where an information theorist would say, oh, I have ways of looking at conditional distributions, uh, even joint distributions, right? So, so here's the idea. I mean, roughly, if we stare at all this and we try to abstract something, we say, well, learning algorithm is stable if its output W does not depend, quote unquote, too much on any particular element of the training data set, right? I mean, this is kind of, if you wave your hands and and say this, like when you're you know, just standing there having coffee, this is what you would say, right? And there's no, there's no blackboard there. Um, well, you know, let's make this precise. Because there are multiple ways of capturing dependence. And once we've done that, what do we mean by not too much? We have to choose a scale, right? So um, when we started working on this, and like I said, our first paper on this was with, um, it was me, Sasha Rocklin, Aulian Shu, Yi Hong Wu, and, and Matt Sao. Um, and the first thing we did was this erasure information, which I'm going to introduce. And then later we realized, you know, Aulin kind of, you know, uh, dug a bit more carefully and re he realized that you can actually do this with mutual information, which is going to be uh, tighter bound, but we'll see where this goes. So let's look at the mutual information between the data, which is an n tuple, and w. And of course, by the chain rule, we can simply express it as a sum of conditional mutual informations. All right, so it's a conditional mutual information between W and the ith training instance given all the previous ones, right? So the superscript i minus one means that I'm just taking the first i minus one coordinates of uh, this uh, bold z. Then this other measure of information called the erasure information, which was introduced by Verdu and Weissman, the journal paper in the transactions is 2008. So here's the idea, you see, there's another definition of erasure information, but, but if you were to write it as a sum of conditional mutual informations, there's a subtle difference. So we're still looking at the conditional mutual information between W and the i training sample. 
but we're conditioning not on the first i minus one training sample. We're conditioning on all the rest, right? So this bold z with a minus i subscript superscript means that what, what I'm doing is I'm gener I'm taking my n tuple of z's and I'm deleting the ith element and I end up with n minus one elements. And so what we're going to show is that e if either of these is small, then the generalization error is going to be small. So this is where information theory comes in. And you know, the nice thing about mutual information and the ratio information is that you know, chain rule gives you all sorts of nice uh, uh, ways of bounding things. And you know, and then if you start combining algorithms in some way, then you know, there's more chain rule. And you can bound these in various ways. So let's see where that takes us. So first of all, like I said, it's the conditioning. So mutual information versus ratio information. So first of all, like I said, our first work because it's the obvious thing to do, had to do with erasure information. And then, you know, uh, we also looked at mutual information, but you see, the conditioning here is different. And in general, so, if z, so you can define, so the idea behind erasure information is that it's defined as um, some measure of dependence between some random object W and some random vector Z. And, it, you know, so the idea is to look at the coordinates of Z in some way. Uh, and here, you know, the definition does not require the z's to be independent. So this, this quantity, you know, obviously makes sense for anything. And in general, you can come up with examples where either the mutual information or the erasure mutual information is larger, or they can be equal. But in our case, the training data form an IID sample. And in that case, you can actually show the mutual information is smaller. How can you do it? So, you know, it's a simple exercise. All right, pick an index i, and let's look at the i term in the mutual information. So this conditional mutual information. You see, because the z's are independent, um, the mutual information between z, this tuple of i minus one elements of z and zi is zero. So by the chain rule, you can rewrite it as this unconditional mutual information. And then you notice that, well, by data processing, now if I append the rest of the, you know, uh, uh, elements, so from i plus one to n, this is going to increase my mutual information. So by data processing, I get this inequality, and then I just uh, do this same thing, but in reverse. I apply chain rule, and I end up this con with this conditioning, and if I sum these up, so, you know, term-wise, um, this thing is smaller than that, so I sum this up, and I end up with, with my uh, inequality. Right? So, so uh, well, it turns out if you know, mutual information is smaller than erasure information, um, right? So, but, but you could still say, all right, um, let's, let's go with these things. So we'd say the learning algorithm P of W given Z is epsilon stable with respect to a data generating distribution mu because we want to somehow capture the impact of the distribution. Even though at, training, at learning time it's not known, we want to say something about the performance. So let's suppose that you know, it's, we know it. Uh, if either the mutual information or the erasure information between the algorithm output and the data is bounded by n epsilon. So here epsilon is the measure of stability and see this is the, the idea is that this is the choice of scale. We upper bound this by n number of samples times some epsilon. And of course, you know, I mean, you could say, but you just showed us that uh, mutual information is smaller than erasure information. Why are you insisting on this? Well, the thing is that many times erasure mutual information is just easier to work with. Um, and we'll see an example now, and it's related to dif differential privacy. But on the other hand, uh, right, so, so uh, stability in erasure information in in implies stability in mutual information. I still haven't shown you what this has to do with generalization yet, but you know, that's coming. Um, so let's see. So here's an interesting definition that we could also think about. And this is kind of, you know, comes from uh, a paper by uh, Raif Basili and a whole bunch of other authors. Um, and they introduce a whole score of definitions. A particular one is they call it epsilon KL stable. Well, KL stands for callback Leibler divergence. If now you see, this is the whole thing. If I give you two data sets, the different one element, then the relative entropy between the conditional distribution of the hypothesis given these two data sets is less than epsilon. 
And notice that this definition, of course, just like a lot of these differential privacy definitions, the data are treated as a deterministic object. And the only transformations we're allowed to do with it is change one of the elements of the data set at a time. Uh, and of course, the caveat, if you read the paper by Bicelli et al, you see that they actually replace epsilon by two epsilon squared for, you know, for reasons of Pinsker, basically. Because they, they ultimately, they want to deal with total variation um, as opposed to KL divergence. But you can now can easily prove that, well, okay, so here's, here's that, that one quantity. It, it's, it's fairly easy to show that a variety of algorithms are actually epsilon KL stable. And once you show that, this immediately gives you, as we'll see, stability in erasure information, and therefore, in mutual information. So it's also useful to see that proof. It's a bit of a handful, but let's, let's see what's going on. Um, so for any i, let's look at the ith term in the um, erasure information. So this is conditional information between w and zi given the rest of the samples. And if you apply the formula for the um, conditional mutual information, you see what you're doing is you're looking at the divergence between the conditional distribution of w given the entire sample versus the divergence of the condition, uh, versus the conditional distribution of w given a sample with the ith element removed. And this one, you, I mean, and this, and, and this, of course, you can, this the conditional distribution is specified before, you know, before seeing any data, right? I mean, it's just this, some, like, if you see the data set Z, flip these coins, run this random number generator, spit out this hypothesis. This, though, this quantity is actually dependent on mu as well. I mean, this is simply definition of uh, conditional mutual information. Now, this, you know, how, how do we compute this quantity? What we do is we say, okay, uh, I take the conditional distribution of W given the Z, and then I single out the ith element, and I just average out, marginalize out the ith element. So here you can simply just, now you rename things. Uh, why do you rename things? Because, you know, it makes the notation shorter. But this Z with the superscript I comma on bold Z prime is simply when I take the original tuple bold z, and I replace the ith element with a new one, z prime. All right, so that's, uh, so that's that. And now what I've done is I've, I've written this, this uh, conditional distribution as a mixture of the original conditional distributions. Now I just use convexity of relative entropy and I know that each of these terms, and notice that uh, z and z, this, you know, with the ith element removed by z prime, differ in one element. Therefore, if the algorithm is epsilon KL stable, each of the terms here is upper bounded by epsilon. Therefore, the expectation is upper bounded by epsilon. And I would just add them up and I see, you know, I have n epsilon total, right? Because each of these terms is upper bounded by epsilon. And this is my definition of erasure information stability. So we see that, um, uh, an algorithm which has this epsilon KL stability property, which, which is a property completely irrespective of any distribution for the data. If that holds, then you know, this is going to be stable in mutual information with respect to any data distribution mu. OK? All right. Um, all right, so now we come to uh, um, the whole sort of you know, idea, how do we how do we relate these information theory quantities to generalization error? Because ultimately, what we want to do is we want to look at differences of expectations, right? I mean, and one of the one of the things that you know, as information theorists, I'm sure you have done, is that when you want to look at difference of expectations um, for some random two random variables of a function that's bounded in zero and one, well, you know, that difference of expectations is upper bounded by their total variation distance. And total variation distance is upper bounded by square root of you know one half times the KL divergence if I'm using Nats, right? Uh, by Pinsker's inequalities. If you have control on, the, on the, uh, relative entropy, you have control on the difference of expectations. Here, you know, we want to say something a bit more sophisticated, so um, we don't want to assume boundedness. So now this is where concentration comes in. Um, okay, so. Let's see, so we have a random variable u, which is real valued, has a mean, we assume it exists. We define the logarithmic moment generating function, or also known as, cum known as cumulant generating function. 
What we do is we, we fix a real, we, we have a real uh, um, input or real argument lambda, and we'll look at the expected value of e raised to the power of lambda times uh, u minus the mean of u. And we take the log of that. And this is a, you know, a very nice quantity. For example, we know that it's infinite, infinitely differentiable. In fact, it's actually analytic in lambda and convex. Its derivative n value at 0 is 0. And of course, you know, where does it come in? It comes into this, you know, suppose I want to compute the probability that u exceeds its mean by more than some t. So what I can do is I, uh, um, I apply the, this you know, strictly increasing function, or here lambda is positive, strictly increasing function e to the lambda u to both sides. Now I have a statement about a non-negative random variable exceeding some threshold. I use Markov's inequality, right? So and then I use the definition of, of psi, right? So this is called exponential Markov inequality. And then, of course, now this is the Chernoff bound. And, you know, when you have a good idea of this psi, what you can do is you can see left-hand side does not involve lambda. Right-hand side does. So you optimize the right-hand side over lambda. And when you do it, you see that um, the tightest bound of this sort involves either minus psi star of t. Psi star is simply the, what's called the Legendre dual of, of psi. Psi doesn't have to be convex, but you know, in general. It is convex because it's a, it's a, it's a log moment generating function. But we know that the Legendre transform of any function is always convex. And here I'm taking only supreme over non-negative lambdas. This is the Chernoff bound. Um, in particular, you know, here's an example. Well, if you use Gaussian, I mean, it could have any mean, but you know, because we're subtracting off the mean, it's a matter, I can set it to zero. If mu is Gaussian with variance sigma squared, then its log moment generating function is exactly equal to lambda squared sigma squared over two. It's a good integral to you know, like practice working with, you just complete the squares and um, do your thing. So you know, based on this, we say that a random variable u with a finite mean is sub-Gaussian with parameter sigma squared if its log moment generating function is upper bounded by that of a Gaussian. Right. So you've seen that, I'm sure. So a classic example is, uh, is uh, uh, now referred to as Hefting's lemma. If uh, u is actually almost surely bounded, so with probability 1, it lies between a and b, and both a and b are finite, then of course it has a, um, has a mean. And, uh, um, and then its log moment generating function is actually upper bounded by lambda squared times the length of this support squared divided by eight. So then any such u is sub-Gaussian and the constant is b minus a squared over four. So in particular, if uh, u takes values between zero and one, then it's sub-Gaussian with parameter one fourth, regardless of the details of the distribution, just by boundedness. And you know, and there are multiple ways of proving it. Uh, the best proof I know is by the exponential tilting tree. Um, so, uh, but you know, you can easily find that. Okay, so now this comes to one of these, you know, long looking things, but we'll need that. So, as I said, we need some, um, some ways of comparing expectations. What we'll need is a way of, um, we have some function f, real valued, and this function is applied to two random objects, u and v. We need to see how far, as far as this f is concerned, u and v, how far they are from independence. So, you know, one way of introducing a proxy that has independence is, is to consider u bar and v bar that have the same marginal distributions as u and v, except they're independent. I want to look at the difference of expectations of f on the original jointly distributed pair u v and its kind of, you know, decoupled counterpart u bar v bar. So here's one estimate. Um, so u, v are two jointly distributed random objects. They don't have to be vectors or, you know, they can be something. And, and we're just looking at them through this kind of real valued filter in a sense. And we're going to assume that this function f of u and v has the following property. If I fix a u and I look at the log moment generating function of just f of u and v is random, so you can think about this. This, what, this in fact, is just a conditional expectation of f of u bar v bar given u bar. 
right? So, so when lambda is positive, I have to have some upper bound psi plus. When lambda is negative, I have to have an upper bound psi minus, right? But with uh, minus lambda, where both psi plus and psi minus are convex, and uh, their derivatives and values at zero are zero. So you can think about these as sort of nice convex envelopes uniformly in U for the log moment generating functions. And if that's the case, then I can upper bound and lower bound the difference in expectations by another quantity involving uh, psi. So here, okay, so what's going on here? U bar and V bar, like I said, are the copies of U and V but now with the same marginal distributions, but they're assumed to be independent. And now this uh, star minus one is simply the inverse of the Legendre, uh, Legendre dual, right? So as a function, right? So the Legendre dual psi star is some function, and this function will actually be invertible, and this is the inverse of that. Um, so in this form, this result has, I mean, so, so these type of results, if you, if you look at, let's say, this excellent book on constant ratio of measure by, uh, um, Stéphane Boucheron, Gabor Lugosi, and Pascal Massart, it's going to be in there. Um, we first, you know, when we first worked on this, we assumed sub-Gaussianness, but, uh, but subsequent work, let's say, by um, uh, Jiantao Zhao, Yan Jun Han, and uh, Tsaki Weissman, they, you know, consider the general case, and more recently, a uh, nice paper by um, um, a soon to defend PhD student at the University of Illinois, Yu Hang Bu, um, generalize this a bit. But this is the idea, right? If you, if you have some control on the uh, log moment generating functions of V for fixed U, of, of F for fixed U, when V is random, then you can say something about these expectations. So, uh, and the proof is actually good practice. Ah. Um, so how do we, how to prove this? It's very simple. So we fix some U and we look at the relative entropy of V given U uh, uh, and, and, and V. All right, so we know that when we take the average of this respect to U, we get the mutual information. But now, if you, you know, Don's Carvaridon duality or, you know, the variational representation for the divergence is something that, uh, you know, this is actually something that uh, you can look up in any book on information theory. Uh, and these days, if you have done enough machine learning or, uh, or concentration measure, you have seen it. It's actually in, in my book with Egal Sasson. So the idea is that you can, you can um, express the relative entropy as a difference of two kind of expectation type objects. And what we're going to do is going to fix a lambda which is positive, and we can lower bound this entropy by the expectation of lambda f with respect to this distribution minus log of the moment generating function of that, except there's no mean. So what we're going to do is we're going to add and subtract the mean, and when you do that, you end up with the following. You end up with lambda that ha and lambda multiplying the difference of the means. And these are two conditional distributions, conditional expectations, right? Here we assume that V and U are correlated, and here we assume they're not. And then, you know, by our assumption, uh, the, remaining, the remaining term is uh, going to be lower bounded by minus psi plus, and then, and then we just rearrange, right? So we see, what we do is we're interested in this quantity. Lambda is positive. So we're going to move this term to the left, divide by lambda, and, and then take the, and then and then optimize over lambda. So what we have is we have so we have this infimum of some positive quantity plus psi plus, which is convex, differentiable, and both the function and its derivative are zero at zero, and divided by lambda. And then there's this lemma, again, you know, if you've studied concentration of measure. Um, there's a slumma in the book by, uh, by Boucheron, Lugosi, and Massard that tells you that this infimum is actually exactly equal to, so with, what, whatever function here, you first take its Legendre dual, and then you take the inverse of that. And then you apply it to whatever constant is in here. Right, it's just like I said, it's a, it's a general uh, lemma that says that infimum over positive lambda of some constant a plus psi of lambda. Here psi is convex, um, zero at zero, derivative is zero. This is equal to the inverse of the Legendre dual at a. Let's just apply it, and then that a happens to be that, um, that a happens to be, 
their relative entropy. And then uh, now, of course, we average with respect to u. And when you average, you see, OK, so if you average with respect to u, the first term is going to be the expected value of f of u and v. And the second term, well, here, there's no conditioning. So when we average with respect to u, it's going to have a product of the distributions of u and v. So these are u and v bar. And then we know that each of these terms is upper bounded by this quantity. And then you know the fact is that, OK, well, so the Legendre dual of any function is always convex. And if I have a convex function and it's invertible, what can we say about its inverse? It's concave, right? If a function is convex and invertible, the inverse has to be concave. And because this function is concave, the expectation goes inside. And once I take the expectation, I get mutual information. And you know, lambda negative is an analogous derivation. Um, I think it'll be. Oh, still go till 10. I think this is going well. But nobody interrupts me. So either I'm losing all of you or you know, it's crystal clear. So I'd like to think it's the latter. But you know, if something is unclear, please ask. But these slides will be put up online, you know, assuming that there are no weird errors in there, which I'm going to fix. Um, OK, so we've proved this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, 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 yeah, that's, yes. Thank you, that first line, first line is also an inequality. Both of these are inequalities. Uh, because of this. Yes, it's inherited from there, yeah, yeah, yeah. This should be an inequality. Yeah, see? Yeah, it's always, and I, I mean, I've looked at this many times and I was over these slides, it didn't even occur to me to. Check that. Yeah, that's 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 an inequality as well by Jensen. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so now, now, well, here, here's this is the generalization error, right? So, so now what we're going to do is we're going to assume. So this is an assumption on just the um, hypothesis space and the data. There's still some supremum here over the hypotheses, but it's just a, it's it's a it's a milder um, it's a milder requirement because you see. Before we had that expected value of the supremum over W of absolute values, blah, blah, blah. And suprema inside expectations are not pleasant things to work with. Because, you know, I mean, so we like to, when we teach probability, we like to go oh, measurability. It, it's something that you sometimes have to worry about, but mostly it's a sort of source of pathological examples. And almost any, anything that, you know, an engineer could write down is measurable. Uh, <laughs> Like, this is actually a quote by uh, uh, SRS Varadhan, who's one of the giants of probability. If you, it's like, if you can write it down, it's measurable. Like, if I can, if I can draw a block diagram of things, then, you know, it's measurable. Uh, so here the idea is that the supremum here is outside the expectation. And the expectation is not a difference of um, uh, uh, empirical versus uh, true. It has a single example, W, and it's this uh, moment generating function. So for any positive lambda, plus or minus lambda, so here the idea is that what I'm doing is I'm looking at the loss of any hypothesis, fixed hypothesis. So the data is random. And this thing has to be upper bounded by you know, psi plus or minus. And then for any learning algorithm with a finite mutual information, we have these upper and lower bounds. So you see that, so you see the mutual information between the data and the, and the hypothesis is divided by n. And then you stick that into um, upper and lower bounds. So when we first worked out this, uh, uh, this thing, we just assumed sub-Gaussianness. So the sub-Gaussian case, which I'm going to show on the next slide, is, is, is uh, um, in this form for mutual information, is uh, in my uh, paper with Aulin Shu from 2017. Um, and well, an, there was an earlier result by uh, um, Dan Russo and James Zhou from 2016 where they, you know, they, they were more interested by, by you know, in, in statistical problems. So, so there, the hypothesis space was finite. And, they also, and their sub-Gaussian anti-assumption was actually not on the, um, not on the data, but more on the outcome of the algorithm, so to speak. They were interested in things like, oh, you know, estimating multiple means, you know, testing multiple hypotheses, that sort of thing. But, you know, similar idea. In the general case with, you know, kind of arbitrary uh, control on the log moment generating function, 
was first done by, as I said, Jao Han and Weissman in 2018, and then uh, Buzo Viravalli in 2019, and that work is going to be presented at ISIT next week. Um, so you should all go and check it out. Um, so the proof is ridiculously simple. I mean, it, so once you have the decoupling estimate, so the ZIs are IID, right? And therefore, uh, because they're IID, and this is, by the way, why it's nice to deal with these moment generating functions, right? Because, you know, you have an exponential, and LZ is an average of a bunch of things, right? And because it's an average, it's exponential of a sum. And, when, and for a fixed W, the ZIs are independent, right? And because they're independent, expectation of a product of exponentials is product of expectations, right? So then we take the log and you end up with this N and you know, one of our N ends up here because like it's, it's, it's independence and identical distributedness and, and then the upper bound just kicks in. So N psi plus or minus, evaluate plus or minus lambda over N. And now we're going to apply the decoupling estimate of the following things. <coughs> our U is going to be W, that's going to be the data. Uh, the, the hypothesis. V is going to be this training data. And L of UV is going to be the empirical loss. So I know uh, the expectation of um, when, when the algorithm actually is trained on Z, this is the expected value of the empirical loss. When, the, when I take an independent copy of Z, this is the expected population loss. You see that eh, that's right here. And you apply the decoupling estimate and get an upper bound in the generalization. And end up with this. And here you have to, here you actually have to do it in this way first, All right? So first you end up with this, All right? So because our, I mean, the thing is that if, if uh, this, um, this function n times psi plus or minus still satisfies the conditions, right? It's convex, derivative is zero, uh, value is zero, zero. And then you just, you know, divide by n throughout. Mutual information ends up divided by n. So you divide lambda by n here and here and, you know, and then because you take the infimum over all lambda, it's the same thing as taking the infimum over all lambda over n. Uh, and then you just apply that, and then, you know, the lower bound is similar. So, you know, the, 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 the simplest case is the sub-Gaussian case, which is what we're going to, mo I mean, I just put, put that up there just kind of for the purposes of, you know, keeping things sufficiently general. But the sub-Gaussian case is the, kind of the interesting one. So in the sub-Gaussian case, we can just take both psi plus and minus to be t squared sigma squared over two. And that happens when this loss function is sub-Gaussian for every hypothesis W. Um, so the reason why I have the, the general thing is if let's say we're dealing with quadratic loss and Z is Gaussian, then you know, square of a Gaussian or square of a sub-Gaussian random variable is not sub-Gaussian. It's actually something called sub-gamma. And it has a slightly more complicated thing. In particular, I kinda, I, so there's one detail I swept under the rug when I said that you know, here we take infima over lambda. The thing is that this psi can be defined over uh, an interval between zero and some constant b, and then you have to kind of continue it outside that interval. Uh, so when you have something like chi squared random variable, that's actually the case. Um, but you know, so you, that's that's easy to take care of. It, it's more of a technicality that you know is not as not as important. But here the idea is that this you can actually compute explicitly. You don't even have to know that this is the inverse of the uh, Legendre dual. You just this is a calculus problem. Right, this is just the square root of 2r sigma squared. And on the idea, so on the, on the idea above assumptions, if the sub-Gaussianity condition holds, for example, if loss is bound, that's going to be hold, that's going to hold for any distribution of z and any w. So on these assumptions, the absolute value of generalization is actually upper bounded by this thing. It's square root of 2 sigma squared over n times the mutual information. So in particular, if our algorithm is epsilon stable with respect to either mutual information or erasure information, then we get this bound. So now, you know, this is, uh, you know, so this is some kind of payoff, I guess, um, right? So we related the generalization error to mutual information. Square root of mutual information divided by the sample size. Um, you know, and one other thing I'll mention before it will be a good time to take a break is, well, okay, so, I will not prove this because it's actually messy to prove. But so far, I've been concerned. This actually goes to that question about why not absolute value. So we've been concerned with the expected, uh, expected value of this thing. 
But yeah, I mean, we might be interested in the probability that, you know, so, so this quantity is something that, uh, you know, because this W, I'm not looking at expectations. W is something my algorithm just generates. It's random, but then I'm going to take that and use it. Once, you know, that, that, that uh, learned system goes into production, that W becomes deterministic. Anything that, you know, anything that's, that's, that's kept frozen after it's been, you know, randomly sampled is already deterministic. And I want to see, uh, well, okay, the absolute value between that and that, and this is something I, I can compute, I want to see the tails, the probability that this is going to be larger than some epsilon. So the thing is that if, in the extreme case, when W and Z are independent, that's just as, as kind of a, a starting point. Well, this is a kind of learning algorithm that just ignores the data and just says some hypothesis. Well, in that case, assuming this LWZ is sub-Gaussian, you can use the Chernoff bound or the Hefting bound to prove this bound. The probability that this absolute value is larger than epsilon is bounded by 2 e to the minus n sigma squared, n epsilon squared over 2 sigma squared for any epsilon. In other words, this actually translates into what's uh, called sample complexity. If I want to guarantee that I have a learning algorithm, well, I mean, it's a stupid learning algorithm, but I have enough data to guarantee that the empirical mean of W is a good estimate of the true mean, I need at least this many samples. You see that the dependence on epsilon is, so it's polynomial in 1 over epsilon and polylogarithmic in 1 over delta. Here, epsilon is the accuracy parameter and delta is the confidence parameter. And you can, you know, show that this many samples are enough to guarantee that this quantity, this quantity will be smaller than epsilon with probability at least 1 minus delta. So, uh, you know, so, so this is the case when the mutual information between W and Z is zero. So what happens when it's not? It's small, right? So this is the result we proved with, uh, with Aulin. Um, so once again, suppose this is sigma sub Gaussian for every hypothesis. And suppose I have any learning algorithm whose uh, mutual information between the, the output of the algorithm and the data is finite. So give me some epsilon and some delta. Then assuming that they have at least this many samples, you see now the number of samples is like, okay, so it's uh, still one over epsilon squared. There's that log two over delta, which comes from hefting. But then there's this other term, mutual information divided by delta. Well, this is enough to guarantee that um, this quantity, this absolute value between the empirical loss and the population loss of W will be small with high probability. So the proof, I'm not going to give you the proof. I mean, this, 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 this uses the, you know, if you've heard Adam Smith's talk, he had mentioned something called the monitor technique. And the monitor technique of Vasily et al., all you really do is you want to prove a statement about some algorithm. So what you do is you run it on independent copies and you post-process the outputs of that in some way. So, you know, so in the original Bicelli et al. paper, they apply the, you know, this exponential mechanism of uh, McSherry and Talwar. And then, you know, they, they, they use some statements about differential privacy of that. We do the same thing here, except we don't use the um, exponential mechanism. We simply sort of post-process this thing to, to pick. Uh, it's a fictitious thing because we don't know mu. But suppose a genie that knew mu could run this algorithm, M independent data sets, end up with M, uh, you know, W1 through WM, and then pick the one on which this absolute value is the largest. The thing is that this super algorithm still, its mutual information is like M times the mutual information of the original algorithm by independence. So it's also stable. Um, and so if the original algorithm does not generalize with high probability, with, with, with this probability, then you can actually derive a contradiction and that's how you do it. There's, there's one shortcoming because this is not really a quote unquote high pro what one called a high probability bound because the dependence on delta here is one over delta as opposed to log one over delta. So Bacini et al. do obtain a high probability bound but only for bounded losses and for differential privacy, differentially private algorithms. It's an open problem, you know, under which additional conditions you can guarantee uh, a high probability bound just assuming mutual information does, uh, being finite does not seem to be enough uh, because, for example, there's a, um, there are various lower bounds in the literature. But some, you know, it's an open problem like under which conditions maybe something, some information spectrum type thing that, that you could uh, use in order to prove a, um, a high probability version of this. Okay, I think this is a good time to stop and uh, for us to, you know, have a break, enjoy some coffee or whatever, and then we'll continue. Thanks. Okay, thanks for coming back for
you know, the second part. Um, so yeah, so the, the, there was this concentration inequality for the like, generalization gap. Um, and I also want to uh, mention a couple of results that, you know, tighten the mutual information bound. Um, I, I mean, when we, when we wrote uh, this paper with uh, first uh, Aulin and Matt and, 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 and Yihuang and Sasha and then uh, just Aulin and me, um, I didn't realize that this would uh, take off in, uh, um, in a big way for some reason. Um, I mean, okay, I can sort of see psychologically why, you know, information theory is like, oh, we can actually apply a lot of information theory techniques to these machine learning problems, let's do it. There's gonna be a session at ISIT on generalization bounds, um, which on Monday, so, you know, you should all go. Uh, and so I'll, I'll mention one of the, uh, one of the results from, from, from one of these papers, and then, and then a result that, that I myself obtained just last week. I mean, it's nothing fancy, it's, it's just another, uh, another tightening, but you know, it, I didn't get a chance to play with it yet. Um, so, so here's here's a here's a result uh, due to uh, Bu Zhou and uh, Vera Valley. Uh, so, Yu Hang Bu is a PhD student at the University of Illinois, uh, working with um, my colleague Professor Venu Vera Valley. Yu Hang is going to defend this summer. Um, so now, you know, think the same assumption. Okay, their, their results are a lot more general than this. I'm, I'm just simplifying this. Suppose now, once again, uh, if I have my data distribution uh, for Z and I plug in any W into the loss, that's uh, sigma squared sub Gaussian random variable. Now for any learning algorithm uh, P of W given Z, we have the following bound on the absolute value generalization error. And you see it's a one over N, not on the square root, sum of square roots of um, twice the sigma squared, which is the sub Gaussian constant, times the mutual information between W and the ith training example. So they call it the individual sample mutual information. Notice that there's no conditioning. And it seems like, okay, this can't be a tighter bound. And actually it is, it's a good thing to, uh, to see this using various information theoretic inequalities. So let's write down the square root of the mutual information between W, the algorithm output and the data, by chain rule and independence. We can write as unconditional mutual information between W and uh, samples before the ith and the ith sample. And by data processing, this has to be larger than the individual mutual information, and then you just use Jensen, concavity of the square root, and then you know you just uh, divide uh, both sides by uh, by square root n, and you'll see that uh, this bound is tighter. And in in fact, uh, using this this uh, bound, they are able to show that even some deterministic algorithms. That are out of reach of the of of the of this the, the my bound with with Aulin. like for example if if I have just a simple thing suppose these are just uh, IID Gaussians and we don't know the mean um, and so W is just a sample mean and it's just, it's not really a you know learning problem in any uh, uh, sort of non-trivial sense it's a, you know just a mean estimation problem but even then the mutual information between W and Z is infinite. But the mutual information between W, so the sample mean, and any individual element is actually finite. So some deterministic algorithm. So you know our bound is designed for randomized algorithms. This bound can actually handle deterministic algorithms. And the proof is actually very simple. Uh, you know, I mean, Aulin actually had a version of this, uh, but we didn't push it far enough. And then you know, it's it's a good thing that somebody in at your own institution actually pays attention to your work and you know, they, and they improve on it. It's always good. Um, so it's a very simple idea. Now what you do is you, instead of working with this different of, difference of expectations, you recall that you can write it as, a, as an average of a bunch of expectations relating to the individual samples. And the thing is that because I've made the assumption about the original Z here, right, I can apply the decoupling estimate to each of the individual terms. Right, and once you do that, I mean, this is very simple, right? Now the individual terms like U is W, V is just ZI, and this is just the loss on individual example, and you end up with this, right? So for each of the terms, and then just triangle inequality gives you, uh, gives you an estimate on the absolute value this way. Like I said, very simple. It's sort of, at the same time, it's embarrassing that, you know, we didn't see it. On the other hand, like I said, it's, uh, it's a good thing, you know, like uh, your own colleagues notice that you're doing something, and they're like, oh, okay, let's go with this. <laughs> 
Um, so, so you hang, I, and I don't want to steal his thunder, and he's going to present this work at ISIT on Monday, so you should all go. Um, but here's another result that, that I derived. Uh, I don't know yet what to do with it. Uh, maybe one of you will do something with that, but here's another idea. So under usual assumptions, so L of W and uppercase D sub Gaussian, et cetera, et cetera. Now, there's no N, but we have this mutual information between W, and then here's what happens. I have this bag of training instances. There are N of them. I just pick one uniformly at random. And then I look at the mutual information between that randomly chosen example and W. And I suspect that this will be uh, manageable even for a class of deterministic algorithms. Like I said, this is pretty fresh. I haven't played with it. Uh, but here the idea is that a learning algorithm generalizes well if uh, its output does not leak too much information about any training sample chosen uniformly at random, which is sort of like this general idea. And it's also tighter than the earlier mutual information bound. Okay, so the proof is actually not that straightforward. Here you have to do a bit of work. So here are a couple of lemmas. First lemma is this. So now suppose I have Z1 through Zn. They're IID samples from some mu. And then I pick an index J from the uniform distribution on the index set independently of, of the data. And then the interesting thing is, okay, so, so now I look at the ZJ, which is, so, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the uh, randomly chosen index, uh, randomly chosen element of this n tuple. Well, so two things. First of all, ZJ has the same distribution as, 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 you know, same marginal distribution, which is actually not surprising. But it's also independent of, of J which is slightly surprising, but also pretty interesting. So, and the proof is very simple. So, you know, so for any measurable subset of the instance space, any index J, let's look at the joint distribution of ZJ and J. Right, so there's a probability that ZJ is in some set E and J is equal to little j. Well, so I factor it using the conditional distribution. Right, so here's the interesting thing. The marginal distribution of, of, of J is uniform, so it's one over N. And then uh, here, this you know, is pretty straightforward to show that if j is equal to little j, clearly the conditional distribution of z uppercase j is basically just the distribution of zj. But, but they're all the same distribution. They're all iid, so this is mu. And now if I marginalize out j, I see that the marginal distribution of zj is just mu. And because they factor into the product distributions, they're in fact independent. But you know, here we do need the you know the identical. They need we need the z's to be identically distributed. And the other uh, statement is that well, uh, for any learning algorithm w that works on the data, well, z j and w is actually conditionally independent given the data. And moreover, I can write the conditional expectation of the loss on a randomly chosen example, given the data as this average, right? So what I'm doing here is now I have. Uh, now the uh, averaging is only with respect to the Ws, right, given Z. And this is kind of obvious, right? I mean, why is it obvious? Because, uh, you know, here's my, uh, here's my learning algorithm. So, you know, here's, here's the data. And the learning algorithm just takes that data and generates W. But then, you know, if I, if I uh, need to generate a randomly chosen sample, I don't look at W at all. I just generate J in ZJ, so this is a Markov chain. And because these are conditionally independent given Z, um, you know, if I have, um, if I want to look at expected value of, so suppose that, suppose that I have something like X and Z are conditionally independent given Y, and I want to look at the conditional expectation of some function F of X and Z given Y, well, you know, this is just that, right? It's distribution of um, X given Y, right? Um, and distribution of Z given Y, F of uh, X and Z, right? It's, it's, it's that. And then, you know, of course, we know that the conditional distribution of ZJ given the data is just the empirical mean, right? Okay, so now, uh, now it's, it's easy, right? So, uh, okay, so let W bar be independent. Same, same, same marginal distribution as W, just independent of everything else. 
And then of course, the, uh, it's pretty easy to see that, well, zj has the same distribution as z, and w bar is independent, has the same distribution. So this is just uh, expected value of the population risk. And here, what I do is I use that conditional independence property. So if I look at the expected empirical risk, first I condition on the data. And then I see that, oh, well this turns out to be, by the lemma, the conditional expectation of L of W and ZJ given all the data. And then I reverse the, you know, the iterated expectation and end up with this. So now you see what happens is the generalization error can now be written as difference of expectations of random variables W and ZJ, except, you know, in one instance they are independent. And because ZJ has the same distribution as mu, the sub-Gaussian assumption still holds. I just apply the decoupling estimate. And once again, this is kind of a fresh new bound. I, I don't know yet. I haven't played with it yet, but you know, it's there. Okay. Yes. To the previous one. There, um, uh, they they are slightly different. I I I, I suspect that they are. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I don't think that the, I couldn't think of an easy way of of comparing them. I, but I can show you why it's tighter than the, than the original mutual information bound. That's actually very simple. So let's look at the mutual information between W and ZJ. Well, so once again, ZJ and J are independent. So by 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 so by data processing, I can first of all you know, insert J here, right? And, by, and, and now by chain rule and by the fact that ZJ and, and J are independent, this is the conditional mutual information W and ZJ given J. But that actually writes down in this nice way. And we already showed that this average of mutual informations is less than mutual information divided by, by N. So yeah, so the random sample mutual information bound is, is tighter than the uh, overall mutual information bound. Um, not clear how it, I mean, because you know the the uh, the Buzo Viravali bound has a square root here, so it's may be larger or smaller depending on how small your mutual information is. Like if mutual information is uh, larger than one, and you know the square root is going to be smaller, et cetera. Um, so that's that. All right. So now I. I think I've bored you with general theorems enough. Let's see whether we can actually do some computations with this and look at some algorithms that actually have the information stability property. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is, from now I'm going to assume sub Gaussian is because it's just easiest to work with. And we'll look at two commonly used types of learning algorithms and show that they are, in fact, information theoretically stable. So the, there are two. The Gibbs algorithm is that, uh, that was worked out by. Uh, uh, Aulin and myself. And then the other class is these noisy iterative algorithms such as stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics where you do stochastic gradient descent and at each iteration you add some Gaussian noise carefully scaled. This is a, you know, once again, like you, you, you know, you write some paper and, you know, uh, most of the time nobody pays any attention. This wasn't the case. So, you know, a lot of people just, I've got an interesting idea. So it was a nice paper by um, um, Ankit Pensia, Varun Jog, and Pauling Lo. Um, in 2018 where they analyzed uh, iterative algorithms. So, you know, this, the first part was going to be something I did with Aulin and the second part is going to be uh, the work by Pensia, Jog, and Law. Okay. So, here's the Gibbs algorithm. And you've seen the Gibbs algorithm uh, when Adam talked about it. So, you know, in differential privacy literature, it's called the mcsherry talwar exponential mechanism, but, you know, I, you know, my background was mathematical physics. It's called the Gibbs, Gibbs, sample, Gibbs algorithm. Um, so, you know, here's the idea. How do we construct it? So we have our um, hypothesis space. We pick two things. We pick a data independent, you can think about it as a prior distribution Q, and a parameter beta. And then the Gibbs algorithm with these ingredients is given by the following, joint, uh, uh, by the following tilted distribution. So what you do is you sample a hypothesis um, from this density. So what you do is you, you, know, you have the prior and then you scale it by E to minus beta times the empirical loss on your data. And you know, so, so the Gibbs algorithm, you can think, you know, one way to think about it is kind of a soft version, a relaxation of empirical risk minimization. You can actually prove that when beta is large enough, goes to infinity, um, for any z, 
the Gibbs algorithm converges in distribution, so it's weak convergence, to ERM. And the statement that does is known as the Laplace principle. So it's, you know, kind of the basis of a uh, theory of large deviations. Assuming, of course, you know, Q uh, has support everywhere on your hypothesis space. In particular, it has to have support on the minimizers of the empirical laws, right? Well, so yeah, so that's, as long as, as, long as the support of Q includes the, you know, the, the minimizers of the empirical loss, you're good. Um, so let's see. So here's, here's the first statement. It's gonna fly here. Suppose the loss function L takes values between zero and one, for simplicity. Then for any mu and any beta, the generalization error of the Gibbs algorithm is upper bounded by the minimum of square root of beta over n and square root of beta over 2n. So you can't make beta too large, but on the other hand, beta could be on the order of like square root n, and you still get um, decent convergence, right? So how do we prove this? That's actually pretty interesting because you get two ways of computing. Uh, so we're going to show, essentially, there, these are two ways of showing that the exponential mechanism is differentially private. One is the standard way, and the other one is, um, Slightly different. That's the one I get. So, so the, the usual uh, differential privacy calculation gives you this. The other one uses more uh, kind of a Hurting lemma, and I haven't seen it in the literature, at least uh, on differential privacy. So maybe slightly new. And you can see that you know here, here these you know you can actually compute the conditions under which this is smaller than that. And there are you know two different regimes of the sort of um, relation between beta and the sample size. Okay. So here's the proof. It's lengthy, but I'll walk you through it. So uh, fix any two data sets, Z and Z prime, that are neighbors. So the Hamming distance between them is one. And let's suppose that it's the ith index that's the culprit. That's the one where they differ. So if I look at the empirical losses of the same hypothesis, you see all the other terms are the same, except for the terms for the index i, and they are scaled by one over n. And also you notice that um, this difference is bounded, right, between zero, uh, between minus one and one. So now if I look at the likelihood ratio, or you know, if you want to be fancy, the radon Nicodym derivative um, of the Gibbs algorithm for one of the data sets given its, you know, relative to its neighbor, well, so we have the numerators, the Q terms disappear, right, so we have numerators. And then we have denominators, which is normalization factors. Well, for the numerator, I can use this expression here. Right? And for the de denominator, I just, what I do is, well, okay, so I have two, two, two dis um, expectations with respect to Q. All I really do is I, uh, if I add and subtract using this formula, then I have the expectation of the same thing, beta over n of the difference now averaged with respect to the Gibbs distribution for one of the data sets. But I know, so, so this term is upper bounded by beta over n, so this is upper bounded by e to the beta over n. And, um, and, and this term, well, yeah, is also uh, upper bounded. So this is e to the two beta over n, right? So recall that, you know, L is between zero and one, so, you know, e, e, this is upper bounded by beta over n, and this is upper bounded by beta. To, uh, beta over n. So, you know, so basically we just show that this algorithm is two beta over n differentially private, right? And because it's uh, differentially private, well, it's epsilon KL stable. That's more, uh, uh, more of a uh, precise thing. And we already know, we've showed the result that if something is epsilon KL stable in the sense of Basili et al, then it's stable with the same epsilon in mutual information. So here epsilon is to beta over n, so that means that mutual information between i, uh, mutual information in w and z according to the Gibbs algorithm is actually two beta at most, because the loss is bounded. So, so that's one of the terms. But then you see there's another way of upper bounding this, um, this relative entropy. How do we do it? It's, you, know, well, you, 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 exp you use the definition of relative entropy. So we already know that this log likelihood ratio is finite. And then what you do is you, you actually, now, now you start computing with this, right? So once again, I mean, it's, it's the same sort of idea. So this likelihood ratio has an exact expression. Um, 
But now what I do is I see the following. Okay, so this is averaging with respect to a Gibbs distribution for the, let's, let's think about it, like the, the original data set versus the perturbed one. The perturbed one has a prime. So this is uh, beta times the expected value of empirical losses for the same hypothesis drawn according to the Gibbs algorithm on the original data set. But you know, I look at the perturbed loss versus the original one. And I know that this is basically just L over N. But then I have this log of this ratio. So previously I upper bounded that. But the thing is that you can actually be a bit more clever with this. As what you notice is that once again, well, it's the same thing here. This is actually a moment generating function of this random variable, right? So, so what, what happens here is that I draw W from the Gibbs distribution and I look at this function of W, LZ minus LZ prime, right? It's a function, I, I'm, not, I'm not putting the argument W to make the formulas, but this is a, uh, to make the formulas manageable, but this is a function of W. This function is bounded between zero and one, right? Between, between minus one and one, to be precise. And because it's bounded between minus one and one, it's sub-Gaussian. Doesn't matter what the Gibbs distribution is, it's just sub-Gaussian. So I use the Hefting's lemma to upper bound this log. So, so this, so then it turns out that here, of course, you have to bring in, um, you have to bring in the mean, right? Because you, know, you, have to, you have to add and subtract the mean, there's the log. And then it just happens to be the case that the mean from here and the mean from here are of two random variables that differ in sign. Therefore, the sum is zero. And I just end up with like that, uh, log moment generating function, which is beta squared over two n squared, right? So, so for this Gibbs algorithm, in fact, so, so, so yeah, I mean, it's differentially private, but its differential privacy parameter is actually square of beta over n. So is there a question? Okay. So, so therefore, you know, for the Gibbs algorithm, you see, because the scale divergence is upper bounded by two beta over n squared, the erasure of mutual information you just multiply that bound by n. So the erasure mutual information is upper bounded by the minimum of twice beta and beta squared over 2n. But since these are independent, the mutual information is smaller than either of these, right? And so I just, and then and it gives me that, that bound over here. Right, so, and the sub-Gaussian constant, of course, is 1 fourth. Right, so 2 sigma squared is 1 half. So that's, that gives us a bound for, for the Gibbs algorithm when, um, when the loss is bounded. Oh, and by the way, so, this, this, so uh, in learning theory, when you get something like this, this is called fast rates. It's like, it's like one over n is called fast rates. I know, it's like high probability means log of one over delta, fast rates means one over n. Of course, you know, that's only true if beta is a constant. But typically, beta would have to be square root of n in order for you to get anything useful out of this. Which, no, which is not, you know, one over square root n is sort of like, you know, you have to strive for that. If you don't have one over square root n, if it's slower than, you know, you probably haven't worked hard enough, but you know, you have something like one over, oh, okay, fast rates. Um, but yeah. Question. Yes. So uh, why does the square root of n, the square root term ever dominate the other? Aren't they? Like no, because of the two. I mean, it's, um, right, so there's two n here. So this one sometimes can be smaller. The first one can be smaller, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's true. That's always better. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's scale stable with a smaller parameter, therefore it has to be differentially private with a smaller parameter. Right, so, just by, but not necessarily because when you go from scale. Oh yeah, you, you lose score. Yeah, it's scale stable with a smaller parameter. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, but the thing is that so so I'm I'm not talking about total variation stability, which we also had. If you have total variation stability, you can actually you can actually if if like the algorithm is epsilon, 
differentially private, you can get something that's even better. You can like e the one uh, minus e to the minus beta over n. But anyway, this is tighter. What is this? Yeah, it's a tighter point. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, okay. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, but you know, so the Gibbs algorithm sort of you know, but where does it even come from? You know, the Gibbs algorithm. Like, why? Why is it even there? Um, so this is something that you know, if you look at mutual information and things, you actually arrive at this. So, um, so let's just look at any algorithm uh, under sub-Gaussianity. The generalization error, right, is uh, the difference of this expected value and this is expected value. And we know that this difference is upper bounded by this quantity involving the sigma squared n and, and you know things like that. Mutual information here. So what I can do is I can say, all right. So I'm. How how do these bounds work in general? I mean, what's the point of getting this bound? The point is the following: like if you, if you run a learning algorithm, and uh, and you get some w, you can compute the empirical loss. The idea is for this empirical loss. Whoa. Some feedback. The idea is for this empirical loss to be a decent, if biased, estimate of how this algorithm is going to perform in the wild. Right? So, so that means that, in particular, this inequality is useful because, at least on average, you know, um, it tells you that if the empirical loss is small and the mutual information is small, then that gives you a decent idea of what its out of sample performance is going to be. Right? So let's see. Well, from this, if we have the sub Gaussian assumption, then for any learning algorithm, right, and any beta, this, this, this is a general learning algorithm, its expected population risk is upper bounded by now the following thing, like just uh, expected empirical loss plus mutual information over beta plus beta sigma squared over 2n. And here beta is a parameter, right? And this is just very simple. All we really do is um, just use the fact that, uh, you know, this square root can be written as this infimum over beta, right? We just kind of, you know, reverse the steps that we had before, right? Why is this, why is this, right? So, so and, and, and then you just, you know, pick any beta you want and, and you get an upper bound. Why is this useful? It's because now, um, you can think about the right-hand side as sort of like another quantity that, that has to do with the algorithm, right? It's, it, it depends on the interaction of the algorithm and the data. So somehow you would expect that if for some beta this quantity is small, then you have an algorithm that generalizes well and trades off empirical loss and mutual information, right? So it generalizes well and fits the data well, in a sense. So, you know, ideally if we knew mu, then we could, you know, of course, you know, construct an algorithm with small population loss, small out of sample loss, fix a beta and just choose the algorithm to minimize this thing. Right? Kind of nice. And you can think of this beta as kind of a regular. So what we're doing is this is regularization, right? If you think about it. And this is actually the idea behind um, what's called the pack Bayes bounds, probably, uh, pro probably approximately correct uh, Bayes bounds. Uh, and, you know, it's a work by uh, uh, Olivia Catoni, David McAllister, and you know other people worked on this. So this is the, the, the ultimate perspective, and this is kind of the ideal algorithm in a sense. But it's ideal, and you know, is a, not all ideals are attainable. This one is not, in particular, because well, this mutual information actually depends on both the algorithm and the marginal distribution of data, which we don't know. I mean, if we knew it, there would be no point of learning anything in the first place, right? But we can take this and we, if we can come up with a relaxation that does not involve the data distribution directly or at least, you know, if it's linear in the data distribution, you can just ignore it and, you know, move the minimization inside the integral, right? Yeah, so, so well, uh, this is where, this is, a, you know, one way to arrive at the Gibbs algorithm. So there's something that all information theorists known as the golden formula. So, now, I think about learning algorithm as, once again, a channel that takes the data set as the input and generates the hypothesis as, a, as an output. So let's fix any probability distribution Q on the hypothesis space. 
whose divergence with respect to the actual marginal distribution of W is finite. And then you can, this is just a manipulation of, you know, like multiply and divide inside the log. And so what, what we end up with is the mutual information is exactly equal to this conditional divergence between W given Z and Q, right, conditioning on Z. By the way, how many of you are not familiar, who's not familiar with this notation for conditional divergence? Like, do I need to write the definition out on the board? I mean, it's, it's it, you know, all it really is is that for each fixed Z, you compute the divergence between uh, conditional distribution of W given that Z and Q, and then you average with respect to Z. And you subtract from that the divergence between P and Q, and clearly, because the divergence is not negative, pick any Q, and this is gonna be an upper bound. And of course, it's minimized exactly when P and Q are equal. So now I can, uh, for, any, for any algorithm, I can take the expected empirical loss and the mutual information. I'm gonna upper bound the mutual information by some Q. So here I take Q, right? And once I've done that, I notice something miraculous. What happens is that, now you see, this mutual information is clearly nonlinear in the marginal distribution of data, right? Because it appears both in the numerator and denominator. Here though, this distribution of just the data, I can, it, it, it's, it's, it's just the expectation on the outside, right? This is the data and then condition on the data, I have my algorithm and here are the empirical loss and they have that mutual uh, relative entropy. So therefore, you know, the upshot of this is, now you see here the minimum is over conditional distributions, which, which basically means that, you know, I have to specify ahead of time what you have to do for every possible data set. But the thing is that here, in order to find, in order to find this minimizer of that quantity with respect to the algorithm, see, this integral is now, um, this expectation involves this algorithm for each fixed realization of data set, and it's a sum of two quantities and now I can now I can optimize separately for each realization of data set and I of course I have to worry about the fact that like this has to be a proper Markov kernel means that meaning that you know there has to be like measurability in Z and etc but you know you can prove that this is the case All right and once you once you get it to this point well you end up with this that inner integral for each Z I can affix any affix any Q and the uh, this integral is lower bounded by minus one over beta times log uh, of, of this expected value with respect to Q. Here Z is fixed, so it's lowercase, and W is uh, obviously random, but with respect to Q, data independent distribution. And this infimum is achieved uniquely by the Gibbs algorithm. And it's an exercise, I mean, like it's, it's a standard thing. I mean, if you've, um, if you've derived the you know, maximum entropy distribution, you'd seen this. Right, so this is one, one way in which you can arrive at the Gibbs algorithm by starting uh, from the generalization idea, relaxing that bound, and then noticing, well, mutual information involves, requires knowing the underlying data distribution. If I didn't know it and wanted to have a good algorithm, well, this is what I would do. And it turns out that you can actually use this to, um, to do some calculations. So now, this is not a generalization bound, this is now just um, a bound on the out of sample risk of the Gibbs algorithm, which looks a little weird. So now we have this beta sigma squared over two n, which doesn't depend on anything, it's just a parameter of, you know, beta is the parameter of Gibbs algorithm. But here we have, it's kind of weird, this, you know, like minus, minus one over beta, um, log another expectation, and then we have, so what we have here is we have z, the data, and we have w bar, Z and W bar are independent, but W bar is sampled from this prior distribution Q that does not depend on anything. And you know, so the idea is that sometimes you can actually get a pretty good handle on what this quantity evaluates to. So, uh, and like I said, these are, if you, if you dig in the literature, these are packed Bayesian bounds. So, you know, for example, Katoni, McAllister, Ortiz, also there's a nice paper by Tong Zhang in the Transactions and Information Theory I think 2006 or something like that, on information theoretic bounds for statistical estimation, where a lot of this machinery is developed in you know, great detail. And now, you know, now, now we can actually, uh, um, if we can bound this log partition function uniformly in the data, then you know, we can actually make some reasonable statements. So 
uh, here's an example. I'm going to give you an example of how, because this bound looks like, what, what do we make of this? So an example uh, of how to work with this, um, it's probably somewhere in the literature. I haven't seen it uh, in this explicit form, but uh, you know, it's got to be there somewhere because it definitely looks like folklore. Um, so suppose that you know, my hypothesis space is now d-dimensional. So think, once again, think about these as like some parameters of some neural net or what have you. We're going to assume, and z is arbitrary, like anything. We're going to assume that um, L, the loss, is differentiable in W, and it's also L smooth. Um, and smooth function, so you know, in optimization theory, when we say the function is smooth, it means that its gradient is Lipschitz, right? So it means that this function grows at most quadratically at infinity, if right? the gradient is Lipschitz. The gradient with respect to, um, and here we assume it's uniform in Z, and here the gradient, so the, the, the uh, del symbol is only with respect to the first argument, and we assume that this gradient is Lipschitz. But we're not assuming that it's convex. So, so let's see. Um, so let's choose a Gaussian prior. So Q is going to be a Gaussian with zero mean and you know, spherical covariance matrix. So it's uh, the uh, individual variance of each coordinate is going to be a tunable parameter. So now the Gibbs algorithm looks like this. What we do is we take our data and then we compute this thing. So this is the empirical loss of W scaled by beta. And this is a, uh, a, a term that, that penalizes large norms of W. And you can think of this row as like a regularization constant. So if you had seen ridge regression or weight decay in neural network training, this is exactly what that is, except you don't minimize this. You sample from this density. That's proportional to this, right? Because this is that Gaussian and this is the empirical loss. And of course, you know, <laughs> sampling from Gibbs distributions, uh, we'll see that the bound actually looks pretty nice. Dependence on dimension is nice and decent, but the problem is sampling from a Gibbs distribution like this is going to be computationally intractable, so it's not like you know, we'll sidestep some sort of a difficulty. But here's the result. I mean, it looks awful, but uh, let me walk you through it. So, you know, so assume the following. So suppose the loss is sub-Gaussian, and then uh, this function L is differentiable in W and has Lipschitz gradients. We're also going to assume that the global minimizers for any, for, any, for any value of the data all lie in a ball of radius r. And it's not such a you know, restrictive assumption because if I, I can imagine my loss being basically kind of like quadratic somewhere at infinity, but you know, so if it's quadratic at infinity, all of the critical points, the points that are gradient to zero have to be in, a, um, in some ball, right? So then we, we, this is now an excess risk bound. We say that then the Gibbs algorithm, the expected excess risk bound of the Gibbs algorithm looks like this. And because this is now the expected uh, population risk of the Gibbs, this is the optimum that you can do knowing the distribution. And then the terms are like this, sort of like this is pi, like the actual number pi. L is a smoothness constant. And here rho is a parameter and beta are parameters. So in principle, you could optimize over them. And this VD is the volume of the d-dimensional unit ball, right? So, so, so the bound, I mean, it, it, like I said, looks ugly-ish, but uh, you know, everything is explicitly there. R is the, and you see that it kind of you know increases with things as as you would expect. Like if L is increased, this is increased. Um, there's a term that increases with rho, but there's a term that decreases with rho. Uh, D over beta log beta over D is a standard thing that you would see in something like these, you know, annealing bounds. Um, like uh, uh, lovas kanon type annealing bounds. So, you know, like everything looks reasonable. And like I said, this is, as far as de uh, dependence on dimension goes, it's actually not bad. But then you realize that, well, in order to guarantee this, you have to sample from a Gibbs, Gibbs distribution. And that's where, you know, there's a whole literature on computational complexity of, of sampling. This is where you run into problems having to do with computing partition functions and stuff. Uh, okay, so, so I mean, and the proof of this is fairly straightforward. I mean, there's very little information theory involved. It's just, you know, being uh, able to estimate integrals. But let's do it because, I mean, it's, it's a summer school. Sometimes it's good to exercise, you know, things that we haven't done uh, since, like, calculus. So, so fix Z, the data set, and let W star Z be any global minimizer of the empirical risk. 
And remember that you know, by our assumption, the norm of that W star Z is less than R. So, and then we assume that our function is L smooth, meaning that its gradient is L Lipschitz. And then if you um, crack open any textbook on convex optimization theory, well, just optimization theory, smooth, smooth optimization, um, there's an inequality that, that gives you control on the um, first order Taylor expansion of a smooth function around any point. Uh, and in particular, because the minimizers all lie in the ball, the gradient is zero. So from that formula, you can actually extract the following thing. If function is smooth, it means that around the minimum, it's kind of flat. Like, you know, if you've probably seen a similar inequality for strongly convex functions, that goes the other way around. That, you know, if you, if you go away from the minimum, the difference in function value starts kind of rising quadratically. Here, you know, the smooth functions are kind of flattish. Right, so the difference between the empirical loss at some w and the minimum empirical loss is upper bounded by smoothness constant divided by two times the squared norm. And now we can estimate this integral, right? So remember that our q is actually a Gaussian, spherical Gaussian, with this covariance uh, proportional to the identity. So what I do is I first um, add and subtract the value at the minimum. And then I use this, you know, this inequality to lower bound that exp uh, to lower bound that exponential. So now you see, it's nice because because what this is a quantity that that just uh, relates the uh, gives us the ex exponential of the uh, minimum empirical loss, and this is a Gaussian, and we multiply Gaussian by another quadratic thing with a shifted w, right? So now we just need to evaluate lower bound this Gaussian integral. And you know, okay, so, so this is what you do. And so you have an integral and computing that is kind of a nightmare. You could complete the square and do it and it's kind of eh, whatever. Uh, but you know, nice, nice way of doing it is, well, pick a ball of some radius. So this is the d-dimensional ball in you know, L2 norm with center wz star and some radius epsilon, which we'll tune later. So clearly whatever this integral is, if I restrict the integration region to that ball, it's going to give me a lower bound because everything is in the integrand is not negative. And once I do that here, I you know, use the fact that if W is a distance at most epsilon from W star, then it's a distance at most R plus epsilon from the origin. And you know, then I do this. And you know, that, so then the Gaussian density can be nicely lower bounded. And I end up with just a d-dimensional volume of B which I know to be epsilon to the d times the vo volume of the unit ball. And then I just collect all the terms and I end up with this. So, you know, like I said, this, there's nothing, there's no information theory in here at all. I mean, it's kind of like uh, just, uh, and if you've, if you've worked with, um, you know, simulated annealing and Gibbs algorithms and whatnot, you've seen these integrals. If you've worked with, um, uh, what's called uh, uh, information asymptotics of Bayes methods, like papers by Andrew Barron and uh, Bertrand Clark on these things. Like you've, you've seen these calculations. Right, and now we just estimate, right? So remember that we lower bounded this integral, then we have to plug it back in here. Right, put that back in here. And then we have to take the log of everything and divide by mi minus one over beta. And when we do it, we end up with with this. So first, of course, we end up with the expected value of the minimum empirical risk plus other things. So here, epsilon is still something that we didn't do. And we just, you know, so how do we choose epsilon? I mean, there are multiple ways of doing it. One is just to, to, to choose it to guarantee that, you know, that you have d over uh, 2 beta. Oh, that's supposed to be 2 is missing here. I'll put that back in later. Um, you just choose that. Um, uh, epsilon to give you uh, like beta over d inside the log, and that's um, so you know that's one of the ways in, do, in, in which you can control this, right? Because this radius is a tunable parameter. And finally, we notice okay, so so we show that um, the expected population risk of the Gibbs algorithm with uh, Gaussian prior q and temperature parameter beta is. Um, upper bounded by this stuff, plus the expected value of the minimum empirical loss. But here's the thing about minimum empirical loss. Like I know that whatever, you know, W star is a global minimizer of 
the population risk, empirical loss, minimum empirical loss is always going to be smaller than that. So I just stick that in, right? Because W star is data independent. And of course, I know that, you know, just by, by unbiasedness, this is the minimum risk. So, you know, so, so the point of these exercises is that eventually you do end up with these, you know, like minus one over beta expected value of log of expected value of some exponentiated thing. Eventually the whole sort of, you know, um, end goal of this is to end up with something that you can, you know, easily separate out the optimal population risk plus other things. And then, you know, bounding these other things is, is a whole, uh, Uh, problem now, right? So that's so that's how you could work with this. Like I said, I, I you know I'm, I'm I'm positive that this result or something like it is somewhere out there, but I, just, I haven't seen it anywhere, so I just worked it out. Um, okay, any questions about this whole Gibbs thing? And there's a very nice paper um, uh, from uh, CMU by uh, by Wang and. Uh, uh, Steve Feinberg about uh, Gibbs algorithm in the context of differential privacy and Mark of Shane Monte Carlo and everything like that. Like really, because the Gibbs algorithm is just such a, you know, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's computationally intractable to get exact samples from that, but it's, it's a good yardstick to, uh, to measure other algorithms against. All right, so let me give you another example. This is actually not, once again, it's not our work. It's a follow-up work by Ankit Tensia um, Varun Jog and Pauline Lo, and it's one again, one of those things that like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Uh, on the other hand, oh, okay, so we actually did something that people noticed. So I'm gonna go slow here because this is, it, there's a lot of notation and, and they consider a very, very general class of algorithms. So this is like wholly their setup. So once again, there, I mean, here the motivation is, you know, really inspired by all of the, you know, so basically these days, if you want to solve a learning problem, you don't even think, you just, you know, I mean, you, you just uh, train a neural net by gradient descent with, you know, some bells and whistles. So now our parameter space is once again going to be d-dimensional Euclidean space. But we're going to generate W in uh, an iterative process. So W itself is going to be some deterministic function of vectors v1 through vt, so t is uppercase, but it's assume it's here, it's deterministic. It's a number of iterations. So the idea here is the following. v0 is chosen randomly, independently of everything else. Well, you can just set it to zero, for example. And you update vt. I mean, if you, so, so these are iterative algorithms with additional noise. So if you've, um, um, if you've come to machine learning from, let's say, the perspective optimization or control, you've seen these things as early as like 1960s. So in 19, and you know, so, so for example, if you had seen books on, let's say adaptive signal processing, there's a you know, famous book by uh, uh, Widrow and Stearns on adaptive signal processing, you would have seen something like what, something called Adeline or other adaptive algorithms. They are all in this recursive form. So what you do is you, you, know, you, you, you have your current iterate and you, you, know, you, you update it based on data and you possibly add some noise and you keep going. Um, stochastic approximation of Robinson Monroe, which is from 1950s, is of this form. Um, and other uh, iterative algorithms. Later I'll show you an example of what's called stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. Um, so, but you know, think, let, let's think about it in the abstract. So what happens is that we generate these iterates. These iterates live in the same space as our W. And so what happens is that there are capital T iterations and each iteration what we do is the following. We first take the previous iterate and we pass it through some transform G. Now from that we subtract a fixed function of the previous iterate and they randomly chose an example, so a single example. We never see the whole data set. Um, we never process the whole data set at once. We'll multiply it by some positive step size and then we add Gaussian noise. So let's, let's once again kind of step back and see what's going on. This is an algorithm that, that consists of two stages. First, there's some iteration that goes on for capital T steps. And this is going to generate a path, a collection of vectors in RD. Then we're going to take that collection and we're going to post-process it. 
And our final hypothesis is going to be some function of the uh, trajectory generated by this algorithm. Now, what do we do? At each iteration, there's going to be a randomly chosen index from between, you know, in the set of 1 through n. And at each iteration, we're going to take the previous iterate. We're going to process it based on that and on the, and then so, you know, so JT is a random index. So we reach into our data set and we grab the JT element. We'll put that in and then, you know, on top of everything, we'll also add Gaussian noise. So here the algorithm has several sort of building blocks. There are these deterministic mappings G. So G depends only on the iterate. F, which depends on both the iterate and on the hypothesis. And then there's this uh, capital F. And the lowercase f, that's when we take the entire data, the entire trajectory of our uh, iterative scheme and, and process it somehow. OK, so it's a lot of stuff. Let me make it concrete. Here's an example of something called stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics. So if you have seen stochastic gradient descent, so we know what stochastic gradients are. So you know, we have some function, and it depends on both the hypothesis and the data. And uh, the, if you average out the data you, and then take the gradient, this is what we would really like to work with. But we don't have that, so we come up with an estimate of that. So any random quantity, which is an unbiased estimate of this gradient, is called a stochastic gradient. One way to generate a stochastic gradient is to use what's called mini batches, right? So we have a sample of n, we have a collection of n samples. What we do is we select a random subset of them, and we compute the gradient, and then we form their, the empirical loss on just that subsample and we take its gradient. And that's called a stochastic gradient. I mean, so if you, you know, I'm sure all of you have seen this and you've all heard this, you know, this elevator uh, pitch, why you would use stochastic gradients. The idea is that if you process tons of data, um, you want each iteration to be as computationally cheap as possible in a sense. So if you have to process, uh, if you have to compute gradients, some gradients of all n samples at each iteration, then that quickly becomes untenable. So you want to reduce the complexity of each iteration by processing only a handful of, of the examples. So summing only just a small number of individual gradients. So of course you're going to pay the price in terms of variance, but it's offset by the reduced computational requirements of each iteration. Um, so you know, here's one, so stochastic gradient is that part. Then there's the Langevin part. So Langevin uh, dynamics is a name for a class of algorithms where at each iteration, you take a step in the direction of negative gradient, and then you add to that Gaussian noise whose variance is proportional to the step size. Why is that? I mean, so, so and this was propo proposed in, uh, I mean, so Langevin dynamics is, is, is a model of uh, uh, diffusion in, um, in, you know, in continuous media. And it you know, dates back to like the early 20th century. Uh, like 1905, 1906. Um, this is where, so you know, ideas like Brownian motion uh, were formalized. So Einstein came up with this, you know, model of Brownian motion, and it turned out to be, you know, something that we call the Wiener process. So Norbert Wiener formalized it mathematically. Around the same time, Smolnikovsky in Poland had a similar model, and then uh, uh, Louis Bachelier in France independently came up with uh, something like that, but to model um, uh, financial markets in Paris. Um, but this was kind of this idea at the turn of the 20th century. And then, um, uh, so Paul Langevin was also a physicist. He came up with, you know, a more realistic model of Brownian motion involving friction and things like that. So since then, Langevin dynamics is a term that's been used in, in optimization and in uh, uh, probabilistic modeling community to model iterative algorithms where you take something like gradient descent and you add to it Gaussian noise. So typically, you know, original models were in continuous time. So you know, this was a stochastic differential equation. Um, and it's still used to model things like chemical reactions. Um, but it's also used in, in machine learning. That's thanks to a paper by um, uh, Max Welling and E.Y. Tay, who kind of you know, brought this Langevin algorithm uh, you know, to, to, into the mainstream practice of machine learning. So the noise, so the reason why you would add the noise is the following. So if I want to, I mean, I'm just going to give you a bit of 
um, you know, a little background. So, and in physics, this was sort of the classic, uh, classic model of diffusion. So suppose I have a system that, a particle that moves in a potential energy field and the potential looks like this. So there's two local minima. One of them is a global minimum. This is called an asymmetric double well. So if I happen to initialize, so suppose I don't do any noise addition. If I happen to initialize the, you know, the, the, the gradient descent somewhere here, eventually, so you know, for, it doesn't even have to worry about the saddle point or about this worse local minimum. It'll just fall into here and become stable and everything is great. But if I happen to initialize somewhere here, then, you know, well, uh, this function being so smooth around that minimum has a basin of attraction. Once, once you know, the algorithm, uh, once the iterate hits the basin of attraction, by definition, it can't get out. So if you don't add any additional noise, you're going to become trapped in a bad local minimum, right? So the idea, to, the idea of adding noise is to provide every once in a while, you just provide enough kick for the particle for this, you know, iterate to jump over this potential barrier and end up here. And, you know, and, and there's this whole, you know, beautiful theory uh, of these processes, and, you know, uh, I've analyzed, uh, you know, th these algorithms with uh, Sasha Rocklin and Matus Tongarski in 2017, like another instance when I did something, all of a sudden people started paying attention. Uh, but anyway, so this is the, this is the launch of stochastic gradient comes from the fact that what we do is at each iteration, we just, uh, you know, we evaluate the gradient on a randomly chosen example. Here, for example, uniformly at random. We have positive step size, and then we add Gaussian noise whose variance is proportional to the, oh, uh, that's supposed to be rho t squared. That's another typo. So if I want rho t, this is square root here. Uh, it's proportional step size, and the concept of proportionality is called the uh, one over beta. So the concept of proportionality is called the temperature, beta is called the inverse temperature. G of V is just V, right? So in this case, F of V and Z is just a gradient. And for example, you know, one thing we could do is we could take, you know, well, the, the simplest thing is take the last iterate. Just, you know, keep running this for T iterations, just take the last iterate, say that's my, that's my, that's where I am. But on the other hand, you know, there are other possible choices. For example, you could take the average of the iterates, which, you know, helps reducing the variance. Or, you know, what you could do is you can actually take these iterates and, and compute the empirical loss for each of them and pick the one that gives you the smallest one. So any one of these is possible. So, you know, so hopefully it convinces you that this is a fairly useful framework that captures, you know, things that, that, that actually appear in, in practice. Okay. So now we're going to make some assumptions. So uh, the, in this Langevin case, this is the simplest thing where at each iteration we pick one of the examples from our data set uniformly at random independently of everything else, but there could be more sophisticated strategies. So in general, we're going to call the conditional, so J1 through JT are indices, taking values between one and N, and the joint distribution uh, of J and the data and the iterates is gonna be called the, uh, well, the conditional distribution of J given Z and V is gonna be called the sampling strategy. So the first assumption we're going to make is that each, at each iteration, the index of the next example you're going to draw, given the indices of the previous examples and the iterates and the data, so when you decide which example to query next, you don't look at the iterates. You only look at the, which examples you queried previously and the entire data set. That's a reasonable assumption. In other words, at each iteration, the index of the sample is going to be the lucky winner at that iteration. Uh, if you know which indices you've picked previously and you could look at the entire data set, that's not affected by the previous iterates. First assumption. Second assumption is the update function f is bounded in norm. And so, you know, now what we're going to do is we're going to com compute the mutual information between w and z. And like I said, it's a, you know, it's a very clever um, derivation. Okay, so we're interested in this mutual information in W and the entire data set. Now, let me um, denote by Z superscript J, bold J, is a collection of examples 
in the order that they were seen during the iteration of the algorithm. Right, and by our assumption, it's clear that the algorithm, the iterates, really only see these indices. So this is a Markov chain. So the entire data set and the, uh, the trajectory generated by this algorithm are conditionally independent given zj. Right, so okay, so now let's, let's work with this. So mutual information w and, and the data. So w is a function of, of this bold v. So by data processing, it's upper bounded by that. Right, and by data processing, this is a Markov chain. So clearly mutual information in zj and v is larger than mutual information between z and v. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do chain rule, right? So here we're expanding. This chain rule is done now over the index of the iteration. So now we need to look at these conditional mutual information terms, which look formidable. All right, so what we're doing is we're looking, we're saying, okay, let's look at VT, the iterate generated by the algorithm at teeth iteration. We're going to look at its mutual information uh, to the, uh, all of the examples that were seen during the execution of the algorithm, conditioned on the previous iterates. And, you know, okay, so, so the, 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 it turns out that because we're adding Gaussian noise, it seems, it seems like, you know, natural thing to do is to do everything in terms of differential entropies. So in particular, we can uh, express this conditional mutual information as a difference of two differential, conditional differential entropies. So first we have the conditional differential entropy of VT given the previous iterates, minus the conditional differential of entropy of VT given the previous iterates and the examples that were seen during the ex algorithm execution. And now this is where our various conditional independence assumptions come into play. So, first of all, let's recall the stochastic update. This is how we generate the Vs, right? So if you look at this, this is pretty interesting. You see that V is a randomized function. This CT is a Gaussian noise that's like independent of everything. You just add it at each iteration. VT only depends directly, functionally as it were, on VT minus one, the previous iterate, and the example that you see in that iteration. Therefore, other things such as all the previous iterates and the rest of the data set, as far as generating VT, are not important. So this, we have this conditional independence relation. So VT, the teeth iterate, and the iterates um, from, you know, sort of two iterations ago, and the data set, the, the samples that uh, were not chosen in that iteration don't matter as far as the computation of VT goes. Therefore, I can exploit this conditional independence. And I can write this differential entropy. So here I'm going to sp split off um, VT minus one, which is the previous iterate, and the example, the data, the data uh, instance chosen at this iteration from the other stuff. And by conditional independence, I can forget about these. So this is now differential entropy, conditional differential entropy of VT, iterate at time T, given only the previous iterate and the sample that was chosen at iteration T. And the same idea applies here, right? I mean, because I can just marginalize out all other things and end up with this, right? So VT, as far as the previous iterates go, you can think about these as like additional randomness, only these matter. And so this is a lemma, right? So under these conditional independence assumptions, this term that appears in, the, in, in this uh, expression actually becomes much simpler. You see, it's a difference of two conditional differential entropies, but now we've eliminated a bunch of the conditioning variables. And then we look at it as like, oh, it's, it's, it is itself a conditional mutual information between VT and the example the training instance seen at teeth iteration given just the previous iterate. And then we can work with that. Like this is again, you know, being an information theorist helps. So let's, let's, um, let's see if we can find this mutual information. All right, so now let's, let's suppose that the previous iterate, we've seen it, now it's no longer random, it's deterministic, we condition on it. So if we condition on it, there's still some randomness that's left. The randomness that's left, so this is deterministic now, the randomness that's left 
is the data sample that has been seen at the teeth iteration and Gaussian noise. And these things are independent. Therefore, what we have is conditioned on the previous iterate. The new iterate is some, you know, vector, deterministic vector, my, and, and then a sum of two random vectors. And these random vectors are independent. This one is Gaussian, and this one is bounded. So if I were to compute the conditional, the, the, you know, the differential entropy with respect to this conditional distribution, well, so first of all, differential entropy, the nice thing about this shift invariant. So if I add a deterministic constant to my random vector, it's not going to change differential entropy. So therefore, I can subtract this term. And now what I see is I have a differential entropy of a sum of two quantities, two random vectors that are independent. And moreover, I know the differential entropy of any random vector that has finite second moments is upper bounded by a Gaussian random vector with the same covariance matrix, right? No? So it's pretty simple here. Uh, the fact that so if I have a random vector u with a finite second moment, then its differential entropy is upper bounded by d over 2 log 2 pi e times the you know, expected squared norm of that vector divided by d. And the upper bound is achieved by a Gaussian. And now I can actually compute the expected value of the uh, squared L2 norm of this. Because you see, zjt and xct are independent. And xct has zero mean. Therefore, these two random variables, the random vectors, are orthogonal as far as expectations go. And because they're orthogonal, this norm is just a, you know, the expected uh, value of the squared norm is just some of the expected uh, values of the norms of individual things. This is eta t squared. This is the norm of that. And whatever that is, we know it's upper bounded by L squared, by our assumption. And this is just d times rho t squared, right? Because, you know, we have a spherical Gaussian. <laughs> And all the, covariant, all the variances of the coordinates are rho t squared. So therefore, by this inequality, we see that this term is upper bounded by d over 2 log, you know, that. So this is 2 pi e times our estimate of that second moment divided by d. Um, and, you know, and, and this is the same, same reasoning, right? Because, you know, if I want to do this conditional differential entropy once again, I condition on vt minus 1 and, and, and ztj. So now this just becomes, um, now if I condition on these things, then both of these term are, terms are just deterministic. The only thing that's left is the xct, the Gaussian noise, which is independent of everything. Therefore, it's simply differential entropy of the Gaussian noise. And that's exactly equal to d over 2 log 2 pi e times you know, the covariance matrix trace divided by d. You know, just assemble these things, and once you assemble these, this is what you end up with. This is pretty cool because you have d over 2, that's the dimension of your problem, log of 1, and then you, you have, so this is step size, right? So here, uh, the idea is that there's like this interesting signal to noise ratio type thing, right? This is the step size and the, uh, you know, smoothness constant, and here we have dimension times the noise variance. And then, you know, and then if you want to be then you can just upper bound this by, uh, you know, use the fact that log of 1 plus x is less than or equal to x. It's a natural log. You end up with that. All right, so now we can just assemble this. So recall our processing pipeline. So what we have is the data set. That data set is used to generate a bunch of iterates. The iterates then give rise to w. And the iterates are generated according to this recursive law. And we assume, as before, so jt at each iteration is conditionally independent of v given previous choices of indices and the data. The norm of f is bounded. L of wz is sub-Gaussian. And then for any f that was used here, we have this generalization bound. And the dimension actually goes away. The reason why it goes away is because you see here, uh, we have d over 2, but we have also 1 over d here. And once we you know, apply the log, the dimension goes away. So this bound is actually, interestingly, dimension-free. Um, as far as the generalization error goes. 
And uh, let's apply it to the, uh, to the stochastic gradient uh, Langevin dynamics. So now I'm going to assume instead of um, smoothness that the function uh, is Lipschitz, meaning that its gradient is bounded everywhere. And then we, you know, let's say we start at zero and then we generate our updates in this way. So previous update minus the, you know, step in the direction of the negative gradient. Uh, and then we add noise and it's, so these, so these uh, C bar T's are just standard Gaussians, IID, and we, you know, the variance is now proportional to A to T divided by beta. And we can consider an arbitrary post-processing here. So like I said, typically, you know, you take like the last iteration, last iterate, but you can, you know, come up with all sorts of other ways. And typically what happens is the number of times you run this algorithm is, is taken to be proportional, um, like some large factor of the number of samples so that, you know, you have a chance of seeing each example at least once. Uh, and you set A to T to be, let's say, one over T. And if that's the case, then you get this generalization bound, right? So, so uh, beta comes from here. So this is, you know, A to, so this is A to T squared. This is going to be A to T over beta. So one of the A to T's is going to stay in the numerator. Uh, you're going to have beta in the numerator, L squared. And, you know, what, what's going to, uh, you know, end up here is one over T and the sum of, one over t, the harmonic sums are up bounded by logs. So we end up with this bound. Beta sigma squared L squared over n times log n plus log k over one, uh, plus one. There, there are tighter bounds of this sort. So for example, there's a paper by uh, Mo et al. that was in, uh, in Colt 2018. Um, they get tighter bounds, but they, but they only assumed that this f is just the last iterate, but you know, Pensia Jung law bound applies to uh, arbitrary post processing. Um, and Yu Hang Bu and, 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 and co authors, uh, like again, you know, I keep plugging that paper because I'm proud of our students, you know, so they use the individual sample mutual information bounds to get rid of this log. Um, that's so pretty nice. Um, all right, so I think I've, I've bored you with, tortured you with enough math. So I want to uh, uh, talk about, just give you an idea of what I had to skip. So one thing I just conspicuously avoided talking about was this notion of adaptive composition, which is, you know, this, this class, you know, central, central idea in, in, in adaptive data analysis. When you, you don't just run one algorithm, you reuse the same data set and possibly the outcomes of previous algorithms to you know, run more things. So this is you know, for, sometimes it's called selective inference in, in, in statistics. All right. So you know, for example, the first stage could be well, look at the data, pick uh, you know how many layers you want in the neural net. Then you take the same data set because you know all well, data are expensive, and you train the neural net without architecture on that same data set, and you keep going. Right. So eventually, you know, the idea is that can you modify your algorithms in such a way that you can keep you know sort of adding on these steps and not you know, degrade the generalization performance too much. So an adaptive composition here is when we generate K hypotheses sequentially according to this process. So we look at the data set, we generate the first one, then we take that first hypothesis and the data set, based on that we generate the second one and we keep going. The, and here, you know, if you want to analyze this, so typically, and this is actually the philosophy, again, like an information theory, in probability and statistical physics and computer science, if you have a system that's built up of various blocks and you can say something about each of the blocks, you want to make a statement about the overall thing based on the local properties of the blocks. Well, the thing is that, you see, each of the subsequent stages looks at not just the data set, but also at the outcome of the previous algorithm. So you can think about it as operating on a distribution that's no longer a product distribution. So what you want to do is you want to impose stability now, not with respect to any product distribution of data, but possibly, you know, but, but essentially all possible joint distribution of Z. For example, the posterior distributions given the outcomes of the previous stages. That's no longer be, going to be a product distribution. So, um, so for example, there's a nice uh, paper in last year's Colt by uh, Tom Steinke and Vitaly Feldman, uh, where they essentially, 
looked at, I mean, the, the, they were interested in something called leave one out stability, which I didn't even mention, but you know, along the way they, they said, well, if you require this erasure of mutual information to be bounded for any distribution of Z, and they construct examples of arguments where that's the case, and then you can actually show that you know, the this, this stability is preserved by adaptive composition. Whereas if you only look at product distributions, you can show that clearly you know, not preserved. Um, like I said, there, there, there are refined bounds for Gibbs algorithms and other differentially private algorithms. For example, like I said, this paper by Wang, Lei, and Feinberg. Um, uh, more recent work by uh, 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 Karina Dugaita and Daniel Roy this year. And then, you know, a very, very nice analysis of the generalization gap of the Gibbs algorithm by Kuzborski, Chesabianke, and Sepeshvari. I think it's going to be in this year's cult. Um, well, I guess it was presented last, last week. Um, I also didn't talk about other notions of information. For example, max information, you know, there's a nice paper by uh, Dwork et al. from 2016. Max information to an information theory is basically the soup norm of the information density. Sometimes it's bounded. When it's bounded, you can actually get a lot of cool things. Um, rainy information and rainy divergence. So for example, there's a nice paper by Ilya Mironov about this. Concentrated differential privacy. Uh, first uh, kind of introduced by Dwork and Rothblum and then analyzed and extended by uh, Boone and Steinke. I didn't talk about total variation of Wasserstein distances. So, uh, I mean, so we introduce, so total variation, you can, you can use total variation instead of KL divergence to look at total variation between joint and a product or marginals, what's called T information. And we've kind of introduced that notion as well in our first paper on this. And then really run with it uh, because you know just working with total, with total variation is often just a lot more pain than mutual information. But uh, there's a, there's a paper by uh, uh, Ibrahim Al Abdul in 2017, and uh, uh, Lopez and Jog kind of took up the whole Wasserstein distance. So we also introduced Wasserstein stability in our original paper, specifically because we wanted to cover the case of deterministic algorithms. Or algorithms where there's like there's some randomness but not enough. For example, stochastic gradient descent. Like without adding additional Gaussian perturbations, stochastic gradient descent seems to be out of reach of you know these information theoretic based methods. So you, you need you know other other techniques. Um, and and also uh, really really interesting work uh, started last year by. Uh, uh, Amir Asadi, who was here, probably still is here, uh, presented his, uh, you know, more recent follow-up uh, during the posters on Tuesday. So first paper was uh, Asadi Abbe Verdu 2018, and you know, follow-up uh, relating to neural net training by Asadi and Abbe 2019. So there's the idea is that, so when I mentioned this um, you know, machinery for upper bounding the expected supremum of you know, this deviation between empirical means and, 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 and uh, uh, population risks, population means. And I basically said that you know, most of this advanced machinery reduces to applying something like the union bound at multiple scales and just kind of assembling it in various ways. It's called, that, that has a name, it's called generic chaining. And it's actually a very powerful probabilistic tool. I mean, it in, goes all the way back to Kolmogorov, but you know, uh, was really kind of refined into a, a very fine instrument by uh, uh, Richard Dudley and Michel Telegrand. Telegrand wrote a couple of books about it. So, so these authors, what they did is they actually used ideas related to chaining, where what you do is you kind of take your hypothesis space and the algorithm output, and you sort of quantize it at different scales in such a way that the, you know, the code books are sort of like nested in, in a certain way. And then use a sub-Gaussianness and chaining argument to you know, obtain like more refined bounds on, uh, on the mutual information. So all of that is, is really nice. And like I said, there's gonna be a session on generalization bounds at ISIT next week on Monday. So uh, you, know, you should all go and see what, what's happening. Um, and here's a couple of open problems. So let's see, so one open problem is like I said, can we get, so you know, I showed you tail bound, I didn't prove it, but uses the monitor technique, tail bound for this generalization gap. And you know, without, uh, so just assuming sub-Gaussian loss and finite mutual information, it seems like getting high probability bounds, like log of one over delta is out of reach of that technology. Um, and it seems like they're actually lower bounds that, that say that in general you can't really have that. So you know, can, can we, what are the additional conditions that you need in order to get high probability bounds? Um, I also talked about uh, noisy iterative algorithms where you, you know, where you take 
something nice like stochastic gradient, you add additional noise, which you know introduces information loss, but it seems to be necessary in order to, to get mutual information stability. Um, methods like stochastic gradient descent, where the only randomness is in the selection of the example to see and not uh, any additional perturbations, they don't seem to be covered by these methods. I mean, okay, so one obvious thing you could do is, oh, well, okay, so use a central limit theorem to argue that the stochastic gradient is actually true gradient plus Gaussian perturbation. And this approach fails for the following reason. Well, so, you know, if you use a central limit theorem, we know that the mode of convergence in the central limit theorem is the uh, uh, weak convergence of probability measures. So, you know, standardized sums of uh, finite variance, uh, independent random variables converge to Gaussians, right? But this convergence is weak convergence. And information theoretic quantities are generally only lower semi-continuous uh, with respect to weak convergence, which basically means that if you, even if you assume Gaussianness and you prove bounds on mutual information, well, the inequality that because of lower sem semi-continuity goes in the wrong direction. So you can't really translate that into anything. Um, and you know, so you know, we have some deterministic algorithm results. Like I said, so in this paper in uh, ITW 2016, we proposed Wasserstein stability as uh, a remedy for this you know, problem of deterministic algorithms. Uh, Buzo and Viravalli show that if you look at the individual sample mutual information, you can even uh, analyze some deterministic algorithms like ARM, um, and also you know, converses. Well, okay, so on one, on one hand, we sort of have, so the inequality that says, Absolute value generalization is upper bounded by square root of some quantity involving mutual information. On the one hand, we say if an algorithm guarantees small mutual information, it generalizes well. On the other hand, we also have, you know, like if we have an algorithm that whose generalization error and expectation is lower bounded, bounded away from zero, the algorithm has to leak some information. But there has to be something more refined than that. Um, does poor generalization necessarily imply information leakage? And you know, there are some results. So uh, Basile et al., this is a different paper. Not the, you know, not the Basile et al. about uh, stability and differential privacy, but uh, another paper with like a different combination of co-authors. And then you know, really more uh, nice follow-up uh, work by uh, Ido Nahum and uh, collaborators, like Nahum Schaefer, Yehudoyev 2018, Nahum Yehudoyev 2019. So a lot of interesting stuff. So you know, this is, uh, so if you thought that, well, you know, I could leave information theory and go into machine learning, hopefully this convinces you that uh, you don't need to you know, leave information theory, you can sort of try and do both. Um, anyway, so, well, thanks, and uh, thanks for listening and uh, you know, suffering through this, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Returning back to the uh, stochastic gradient descent problem, in the yep. Bayesian community, there's an issue of trying to scale up inference to large problems, which has given rise to a lot of the subsampling strategies you mentioned a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it's known that in the case of mini batch sampling, when you have very imbalanced data, mini batch sampling is typically a bad idea. Right, yes. What information theoretic perspectives in that analysis maybe could design better button bias subsampling strategies maybe to improve algorithmic oh. performance? Uh, oh, it's an interesting thing. Um, right, so in a Bayesian context, I guess, you know, the, the main point of these things is uh, sampling from a posterior, right? So, so you, you, you're doing something like Langevin uh, gradient dynamics where you're, uh, the potential, the function you're optimizing actually negative log of um, the likelihood, right? Because, you know, group. Um, and, you know, so, so what, what should be the gradients for, for that? I mean, um, So part of this, like I said, this, some ideas related to differential privacy were in these works by uh, Wang Lei and Feinberg, where they looked at specifically at MCMC. Um, but I would say that, the, you know, recently, I think it's more fruitful to look at something like um, Hamiltonian MCMC, where instead of Langevin, you actually introduce kind of a slowed down momentum term. And, and, and these algorithms seem to provide so 
So for, for example, in the context of sampling, there's this interesting, almost like an acceleration phenomenon that if you have, a, let's say, a strongly convex potential. So in the case of um, Bayesian inference would be strongly log concave densities. Uh, if you use um, Hamiltonian uh, relaxation of Langevin, um, also called underdamped Langevin dynamics, then you know you have quadratic speed up in terms of number of iterations. So that can actually buy you some uh, variance reduction if you you know trade the number of iterations against batch size. For you know, but for potentials are not log concave but possibly something like semi-log concave or something like that, you can, you, you know, there are results that show acceleration, but you know, the, the rates are still sort of, they're exponential in the condition number of, um, of the Hessian of the density. But um, that still, I guess, you know, gives you a bit of leeway, but you know, I mean, that's, that's the best I can answer for this. Thank you. Yeah. So um, one question is how, how um, so the, the results on, on uh, s noisy stochastic gradient descent that you mentioned had some generalization bounds that you, sa you said in the sort of, you, the way you set it up, there was no dependence on the number of iterations, or you said that there's a way to remove the dependence on the number of iterations. By, you know, by, by doing step size. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the question is, so those dynamics also converge to some uh, Gibbs distribution. Yeah. And how, how different are the bounds that one gets for those iterative dynamics from the bounds one would get for sampling exactly from the kind of distribution for which they're, to which they're supposed to converge? Um, OK. So they, <laughs> they're actually very different, right? So, I mean, this was actually uh, uh, um, the content of our uh, cold 2017 paper with uh, Sasha Rocklin and uh, Matu Stolgarski, where we analyzed um, the convergence of the Gibbs, uh, uh, the convergence of the uh, stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics to the global optimum. And so the way we did it is we said, okay, so well, if you take the, con if you look at the continuous time limit, in continuous time, this Gibbs, um, the, the uh, Langevin dynamics has the invariant distribution, which is unique and which is the Gibbs distribution. Um, and so if you could sample from the Gibbs distribution, we actually have a generalization bound. The, the, the uh, generalization bound for the Gibbs is more or less this D, D over beta log beta over D, right? Uh, plus, you know, plus like beta over N. So if you could have an exact sample from Gibbs, you'd be golden, right? But the problem is that the um, convergence of the um, stochastic gradient Langevin dynamics to Gibbs is very slow. It's exponentially fast, but the constant is related to the spectral gap of, um, of the Langevin dynamics. And that spectral gap can actually be exponentially small in dimension um, in, you know, in general, unless you know, your, your landscape has some you know, favorable structure. So from that perspective, uh, whatever generalization bound you get will be completely overwhelmed by the slow convergence to equilibrium. Because for example, this bound, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, so this bound here says, oh, take the step size of one over T. Uh, the problem is that that's too small if you, you know, if you, if you are doing something like, uh, you know, uh, non-convex optimization with a lot of local minima, right? Because, you know, you're not going to take very big steps. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a, there's a careful trade-off that uh, that you have to kind of take into account. Generalization, because generalization bounds are just one part of the picture. Uh, if you now want to look at, um, I mean, it's 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 actually more fruitful to look at uh, convergence to, let's say, a good local minimum with nice generalization properties. There, there we can actually say something better. I mean, you can actually show that. Uh, you can converge to such a global, uh, such a local minimum in polynomial time, and and you can tune the parameters in such a way that you can stay around that local minimum for as long as you want with high probability. I mean, you have to tune the temperature parameters in just the right way. But uh, yeah, I mean, the generalization uh, bounds are just part of the picture. If you want to have proper excess loss, uh, you know, bounds that all of these nice things like this dimension freeness kind of goes away, and you know. 
Because this is just a generalization bound. It's not, it's not an excess risk bound. Like for the excess risk bound, there's no way to do better than like D over beta log beta over D for Gibbs. Because that's, that's the annealing bound. 